When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to Unshaken. I'm Jared Halverson, and I hope you're ready for a deep dive in the Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, I still want it to be deep. We might have to change some of the length. Uh, this is coming on the heels of two of the longest lessons we've had so far, uh, basically because sections 98 to 101 and section 102 to 105, uh, that material for Come Follow Me these past two weeks have been the most verses that we've needed to study uh, of any week so far this year. And so they made for practically eternal lessons, uh, and, and I recognize just how much time those, those uh, require of you. I also recognize how much time they require of me, believe me, uh, and with, uh, I'm in the thick of the, of the semester now, uh, teaching a full load of classes at the Institute, in addition to some other classes, uh, three nights a week in three different cities is really intense. And so, uh, whether this is preview of coming attractions, because if uh, hoping that we can make this sustainable through next year uh, in the Old Testament, which will require a shift of format. There's no way we'll be able to keep up a verse-by-verse -verse approach in the Old Testament. There's 1,100 pages, uh, and the Doctrine and Covenants only has close to 300 and, and, that, and, it's, and it still makes for long lessons. So next year, it'll be impossible to do it this way. Uh, we'll have to be much more selective. Uh, again, I'm hoping to, to, to continue on the depth that we have, uh, the insight, the, the picking apart words and phrases and trying to make sense of what the Lord's trying to teach us here. But there'll have to be shorter lessons uh, and we'll have to be more selective. So uh, sorry uh, if you're used to the, the long ones and prefer it that way. Uh, sorry if you want every single verse uh, explained, and uh, and not sorry, uh, or congratulations, or thanks for enduring it well, if you're the type that's like, man, I love these, but man, they, t they do take a long time. Uh, and do we really need to talk about every single verse? Well, I think there's power in every one. Uh, but anyway, today we'll have to be a little briefer, and that m might be true going forward through the end of this year, just depending on on if I can keep my snorkel tip out above the, t the surface of the water, and I pray that that, that will be the case. Now, uh, today we're going to be covering section 107 as kind of the, oh, the apex of the lesson, the climax. Uh, it's an incredible revelation, book ended by two much shorter ones in 106 and 108. Now, when, when we open up our Doctrine and Covenants to section 107, we're already on page 215, okay? We're, we're, uh, we're nearing the end of the book in some ways, okay? Uh, but if you were to live as a saint in 1835, when the Doctrine and Covenants was first published, you would open up the cover and see, well, you'd see the lectures on faith. That's the doctrine side of things. But once you got to the covenants, these revelations that we have, the first would be what we now see as section one, the preface to the Doctrine and Covenants, always supposed to be the start. Next would be what we have now as section 20, the Articles and Covenants of the Church, kind of the Constitution, that's how we lay it all out. And the third revelation people would read would be what we now see as section 107, laying things out as far as priesthood organization. Ecclesiology is the technical term. How is the church going to be organized and run? The next revelation, by the way, would be section 84, or well, what we now see as section 84. So it's just interesting. Let's, let's give the preface to this book, and then let's set up the church with 20 and, and, eight, and 107 and 84, the three great priesthood revelations. Uh, and one of the things I love about uh, now, what chronological order, that by the time you get to 107, and we've learned so much about priesthood already, this is going to further clarify some things about the organization of priesthood quorums and offices within it, uh, as well as quorum leadership, and also clarify some of the, or even just kind of deepen their understanding and appreciation for what the priesthood's all about. But it ends with a verse that, that calls us all to learn our duty. Any of us, male or female, who functions in God's name and therefore requires priesthood authority to do so, we have to learn our duty. And what I love about the way it's set up now is this revelation is bookended by two men who do exactly that, who come to Joseph Smith seeking an understanding of their duty within their priesthood offices. I think that we should be able to follow suit. 
Yeah, and anytime you get a, a new calling or a responsibility in the church, whether it's a horizontal petition to a priesthood leader or a quorum or class president, uh, any kind of leader, how do I serve in this calling? Or, best of all, a vertical petition when you seek the Lord and ask, how can I magnify this calling that I've been given? Well, 106 and 108 are beautiful examples of that. Now, with 106, we get to meet a cowdery. Now, we've known Oliver for a long, long time. We met him back in section 6, right? He's had the spiritual experiences just first hearing about the Book of Mormon, and he goes to meet Joseph Smith and quickly turns into his scribe. And then joins him as second elder of the church, uh, present with him in the restoration of the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood. Uh, he still has an amazing role to play in this dispensation. But that was 1829. And now it's mid-1834, and his older brother Warren finally gets around to joining the church. Now that, in and of itself, I think teaches us something. That conversion is, is unique to the individual. And there are some, like Oliver, who join the church, well, the church wasn't even organized yet, but who come to know of the truthfulness of the restored gospel, even before they meet Joseph Smith. Uh, there, there's those that their conversion happens so quickly, and perhaps that describes some of the people you met in the mission field, perhaps that describes many of you, and there's just that, that resonant frequency we talked about back in section 84. It just rings so true, and it draws you, and there's no obstacle, nothing in your way, uh, or you get over them very quickly and you join the church, you accept the gospel. Well, that was Oliver's experience, but Warren's was different. And that's okay. Uh, Brigham Young himself took a long time before he finally gained a testimony. And Warren was, was similar. He was uh, older than Oliver. He was more established uh, and therefore more respectable and more concerned about the opinions of other respectable people. He was a person of uh, have some prestige in his town. It was a, city, a, a town called Freedom in New York, Western New York. He, had, he owned an apothecary. He was the, the postmaster there. In fact, his house was the first brick home that was built in Freedom. Uh, and so people looked up to him. It's kind of the, the, the Martin Harris uh, uh, sort of uh, mentality that I'm the prosperous farmer here in Palmyra and I have credibility and respectability and I'm not sure about Joseph Smith and a gold Bible until he gains his own testimony. But even then, it's like, oh, can I have the 116 pages to prove to people, so to, to let them know I'm not deluded. And, and in a way, that was a concern of Warren Cowdery as well. What will people think of me? At one point, he'd even written that thousands of respectable people think that we are deceived and deluded. And you can kind of get that sense of, oh, public opinion, and what will the neighbors think? And the sense of shame that early saints and saints to this day would need to overcome and care more about what God thinks rather than what their, their fellow men think. Not only that, but his experiences were different from his little brothers. And when you think about all the, the heavenly manifestations that Oliver received, and, and Warren did not. I mean, when he began attending church there in Freedom, New York, uh, he said he, he felt some manifestations of divine approbation. Okay, so I feel that God is pleased with the decisions that I'm making, the steps that I'm taking. And we'll see that more clearly in section 106. But he also admitted in a letter to his younger brother, I have a thousand times wished I could have that evidence that you have had. That, to me, there's just something beautiful there about these two brothers uh, and the different experiences they have in coming unto Christ and receiving a testimony of the restored gospel. And for some, it's the, the Paul on the road to Damascus, or it's, it's Alman, the sons of Mosiah, with the angel descending from heaven. And for others, it's that still small voice and, the, and wondering what people will think, but then coming to know that God is pleased with cho choices that you're making and just finally deciding to submit to the will of God and, and, and covenant to follow Him. At first there was distance, and then there was, there was an embrace. In earlier letters from Warren to, to Oliver, he would say things like, your people and your church. And by the time he joined, it was like, our brothers and sisters. And so I love the shift of those possessive pronouns. Oh, well, that's your thing. Well, now it's, it's our thing. It's a beautiful evolution uh, of that acceptance and that embrace of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Part of it, by the way, happened, had to do with Remember the last few weeks we've talked about this higher moral ground that the saints were giving testimony and witness of, evidence to the world because of the way they were renouncing war and proclaiming peace? 
uh, uh, because of his younger brother, Oliver, who had been there in Jackson County, Warren is well aware of what the saints are suffering with all of that persecution. And it's softening his heart. It, that, to, that to me says something. That on the one hand, it, it wasn't all of Oliver's spiritual witnesses and his testimony of the, of the miraculous things that happened in his life. I mean, that probably was uh, you know, weighing on, on, on Warren, of course, but, but it, was, it was the persecution and just the soft heart on his part of, I can't believe that my brother and his people, his church, is going through something like that. How could that happen? Well, with that softened heart, when Joseph Smith and others are on their, their recruiting mission for Zion's camp, Joseph actually stays in Warren's home for a night as he's preaching the gospel there in that vicinity. Uh, I mean, it's, there's, not, there's not a hotel uh, typically to go stay in, so it's like, oh, you're related to a, a good friend of mine, can, can I stay with you? Well, of course, hospitality rules. But to have come to know Joseph a little more personally and to hear him preach, well, that was another step forward uh, until Warren Cowdery finally decided, I know that it's true. And, and, I, and he joined the church. Now, what, what's interesting, well, again, the saints are gathering in Kirtland. They're gathering in Missouri. But there's still these scattered branches all over the place, especially in western New York. And, and the branch in freedom has really grown quickly. But they're, they're devoid of some leadership to the point that Warren Cowdery, this new convert, with a connection to the first and second elders of the church, uh, he, he writes and says, you know, we could really use some leadership here. Well, be careful what you ask for. Because when Section 106 comes uh, as direction to Oliver, Cow- uh, to, excuse me, to Warren Cowdery, guess who's called to preside over the church there in freedom? You guessed it, Warren Cowdery. I think sometimes we're, we're, we see a need and we're like, you know, I wish somebody would do something. Or, you know, they ought to. And it's this vague they until we realize, wait, I'm the they. We are the they. If somebody's going to do something, why not me? Roll up the sleeves and get at it. And, and with the Lord's command here in section 106, this beautiful little revelation, Warren, you're right. Your branch does need leadership. And that leadership is you. If you look at verse 1, how it begins, It is my will that my servant Warren A. Cowdery should be appointed and ordained a presiding high priest over my church in the land of freedom and the regions round about. This could be the equivalent of a bishop. It could be the equivalent of a stake president. It's, it's leadership on the local level presiding over others uh, in that area. And here he is a presiding high priest. Uh, office in the Melchizedek priesthood with presiding responsibility. In verse 2, he should preach my everlasting gospel and lift up his voice and warn the people, not only in his own place, but in the adjoining counties. So not only are you perfecting the saints in verse 1, you're proclaiming the gospel in verse 2. And again, for someone who was concerned to what people thought about him, he's going to need to get over some things. Right here where people look up to you, where you are known. Well, now let it be known among them that you have embraced the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. That you haven't been deceived or deluded. You can bring some respectability to the church among all these respectable people that look down upon it. And, but that takes some, some humility on, on one's part. That takes some caring less about what other people think. Verse 3, he should devote his whole time to this high and holy calling, which I now give unto him, seeking diligently the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness, and all things necessary shall be added thereunto, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. We've seen that kind of language earlier in the Doctrine and Covenants, as well as in the New Testament, when Jesus taught his earlier followers Uh, to leave the world and come unto him and serve in these kinds of capacities. Your whole time, this is a high and holy calling, so it deserves your highest priority and and a whole-souled dedication to the work. And there's a sense of urgency here. Verse 4, Again, verily I say unto you, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, and it overtaketh the world as a thief in the night. Therefore gird up your loins, that you may be the children of light, and that they shall not overtake you as a thief. Interesting verb, to be overtaken. It's like you're running and somebody catches up and passes you. Uh, my, I was convinced, uh, well, some arm twisting went on for about a month before I finally relented. But my brothers-in-law are all incredible runners, and they convinced me to join them on one of those brutal 
uh, kind of Ragnar sort of relay things. This was the, the mother of all relays. It was the Hood to Coast race in Oregon. And we started at, at the top of Mount Hood and ran 200 miles until we got to the Oregon coast. Uh, it was amazing in a really masochistic sort of a way. Uh, but it was interesting to, to run and there's this, this desire to pass the people in front of you. So you can, they call them kills. Uh, well, I, I wasn't fast enough to kill many people. Uh, I, I, I was just grateful to survive. But it was interesting to, to hear the footsteps behind me. And no, I'm about to get killed. I'm about to get passed by someone. At one point, me and another runner that were not too fast, we just passed someone and she wished us well. But shortly after we passed her, we're still within 10 or 15 yards. And this other woman just flew past all three of us. And the woman we just passed yelled at us, two, two guys, and said, oh, that, that girl's d d destroying you. You know, hurry up. And I just laughed. I'm like, she's welcome to it. Uh, she just, you just go right ahead. But there's this sense of being overtaken by something. Well, in this case, to be overtaken by the coming of the Lord as a thief in the night, the Doctrine and Covenants has been full of so much, you know, hasten the day, right? And pick up speed and prepare ye, prepare ye for the coming of the Lord is nigh. Uh, this book is second coming prep. And the Lord does not want to catch us unawares. Hence the signs of the times and the heads up for the signs of the times that we see. But are we... Are we moving forward at the speed the Lord would have us? Or are we too slow to the point that we will be overtaken? And by the time the second coming is here, we're not out leading the way to prepare the world, but rather the thief came and, and we were the ones that were overtaken. Now we, as best we can, we need to keep pace with the, with the hastening of God's work. When you look at the way that the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve works, as, they, as these presiding high priests are out preaching the gospel and doing everything else that Warren Cowdery is called upon to do here, it's amazing. I feel like, wow, they are overtaking me. I remember back in President Hinckley's day, I think it was Elder Ballard once joked and said, yeah, the only reason President Hinckley ever comes home between trips is to trade out the apostle he just wore out and get a fresh one. It's almost like the Pony Express. <laughs> like, okay, Elder, you're, you're done. I need a new one now. Okay, I have a fresh pair of legs. Well, Warren Cowdery is a fresh pair of legs, and he will serve diligently in his callings, not just in freedom, but as he gathers with the saints and moves forward in his life as a member of the church. Now, verse 6, again, verily I say unto you, there was joy in heaven when my servant Warren bowed to my scepter and separated himself from the crafts of men. That, to me, speaks to all of that, oh, the delay, perhaps, the, the difficulty on his part of, but what will people think? They look up to me. I'm, I'm the postmaster. I have a brick home. I own an apothecary. I, I'm a leader here. And the Lord's like, exactly. And you'll be a leader in my kingdom as well. As soon as you bow your head to my scepter, if you will lower yourself, I will bring you high. If you care less what other people think, you'll know what I think about you. And here's what it is. Joy in heaven. To distance yourself, separate yourself from the crafts of men. We talk about priest craft, but Joseph Smith also complained about lawyer craft and doctor craft and politician craft. There's so many crafts out there. And while I'm not saying anything negative about people who have jobs and professions that we all need to, to, to function in, there's still something that if your craft, in fact, isn't that the word used in Acts when, it, when the, the worshipers of Diana were, were so angry or the silversmiths that were, you know, this preaching of the true God at the expense of all these false ones? Well, that, you're, you're working in on, on my territory. You're interfering with my, with my business. You're ruining my craft. And there's something about overcoming the crafts of the world separating ourselves from those things so that our energies and our efforts can go towards building the kingdom of God. Believe me, anytime we do that, there is joy in heaven. There'll be joy here on earth as well. In verse 7, Therefore, blessed is my servant Warren, for I will have mercy on him. And notwithstanding the vanity of his heart, I will lift him up inasmuch as he will humble himself before me. Oh, the Lord always knows our weak spots, right? And if that was one of the things that delayed his conversion so long, 
because he was worried about other people. That's, there's the vanity of his heart. What will people think of me? But if you'll humble yourself before me, if you lower yourself, then I will lift you up. Where the opposite is also true. We talked about that earlier uh, in section 104 about consecration. And those that are lifting themselves up economically will need to be brought down. Uh, whereas the poor, those who have chosen to be humble uh, or submitted to circumstance which has humbled them, will be exalted. Same thing here in verse 7. Verse 8, he's then promised, And I will give him grace and assurance wherewith he may stand. And if he continue to be a faithful witness and a light unto the church, I have prepared a crown for him in the mansions of my father. Even so, amen. Who cares about your brick house in freedom? You can have a mansion in the kingdom of your father. Who cares about how oh, people looking up to you uh, and to have the respectability of your neighbors? You will have a crown prepared by God himself. Rather than somebody looking up to you because you own an apothecary, the, the church will look up to you as you serve as a light and a leader for them but only if you continue faithful. If you'll do that, then I will be with you and bless you all along the way. I'll give you grace so that you'll be able to function in this high and holy calling. I will give you assurance. It may not be the, the dramatic divine manifestations that your little brother enjoyed five years ago, but it will be assurance that you're exactly where you need to be. If we can open our hearts to that kind of assurance, and live faithfully to receive that kind of grace, then we'll be lights to other people in darkness as well. That's exactly what, what Warren, oh, the kinds of experiences he'll have later. He helps uh, pen or record the, the dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple, which we'll study next week. Oh, he has a beautiful role to play, but he, he can't play it until he bows to God's scepter and, and cares a little bit less about the, the scepters, so-called, of the world. Now, with this new high and holy calling, Warren Cowdery and everyone like him is going to need to understand the, the duties and responsibilities that they have. And that's, again, like I said before, what section 107 will accomplish. Now, 107 is an interesting revelation. It's one of, a, it's one of the best examples of line upon line, precept upon precept, understanding, uh, an evolution of understanding as far as what priesthood or church or gospel is all about. It did not come all at once. In fact, in, in a way, it's got reverse order here. Because what we'll see, the, the second half of this revelation from about verse 60 on, was a revelation Joseph received actually early on, way back in 1831, that laid out some foundation for offices in the priesthood and, and quorum leadership and bishops and so on. A lot of those things were implemented at the time, but not fully. The church itself had to grow into an, an understanding of and, in, and an implementation of this revelation. Uh, but the stuff that it precedes it, the first half of this revelation, is what came later. By then, it's early 1835. The, quorum, the first quorum of the Twelve Apostles has been called. Remember last week when we talked about Zion's camp, and when they turned around and had to come back to Kirtland, and, others, and many thought, oh, that was a failure. And others realized, no, we, we got everything we came for. This was not to redeem Zion place. It was to, to purify and prepare Zion people, namely 12 men that could go and, and bear off the kingdom triumphant, an original quorum of the 12, as well as uh, members of a quorum of 70 that would assist the 12 in all their work. Uh, those, uh, those that were called into those high and holy callings uh, were those who had proved themselves willing to offer, uh, to observe their covenants by sacrifice, even laying down of their lives if necessary, to prove their discipleship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, by now, they're preparing to leave on a mission to the eastern states. But they come together, along with Joseph Smith, and they plead with the Lord for, for revelation. We want to understand better our duties and our callings. We want to, to receive the guidance of God as we move forward on this mission. In fact, the way they put it is so beautiful, so humble. No vanity of the heart on their part. In fact, this, even before the revelation came, this meeting began with them confessing their sins to one another. I mean, talk about a unifying experience, a vulnerability that opens hearts to one another. 
No, I, I'm not saying we need to air our dirty laundry in fasting testimony meeting, but a dose of raw reality can really be helpful and just connect to someone as, again, there's no vanity of the heart. They humble themselves before the Lord and, and the Lord lifts them up and sends them forward. That's exactly what happens with this uh, original mission of the Quorum of the Twelve. But the way they said it, the time when we are about to separate is near. And when we shall meet again, God only knows. We therefore feel to ask of him whom we have acknowledged to be our prophet and seer, that he inquire of God for us and obtain a revelation, if consistent, that we may look upon it when we are separated, that our hearts may be comforted, Section 107 is what's going to come as a result of that. So think of that. We want to look at this revelation to comfort our hearts, to bind us as brethren, even when we are separated. They went on and said, Our worthiness has not inspired us to make this request, but our unworthiness. Such beautiful humility there. Such contrition, broken heart, contrite spirit. We have unitedly asked God, our Heavenly Father, to grant us through his seer a revelation of his mind and will concerning our duty the coming season, even a great revelation that will enlarge our hearts, comfort us in adversity, and brighten our hopes amidst the powers of darkness. Well, ask and ye shall receive. And in humility, in meekness, in an admission of their unworthiness, they did ask for a revelation, a great one, and they received one that is great indeed. As we now study it, I hope it will enlarge our hearts and comfort us in adversity and brighten our hopes amidst these days of darkness. It begins stra- very straightforwardly. Again, if we, if we were to reverse it and do it more chronologically, the second half has a more kind of normal beginning of the revelation. And this is, we're just jumping right in, okay? There are in the church two priesthoods, namely the Melchizedek and Aaronic, including the Levitical priesthood. Now, even from the get-go, this can be a little confusing, even though the Lord's trying to, to clarify things here, because it's like there's only two. And here he lists Melchizedek, Aaronic, and Levitical. Wait, isn't that three? Well, no, because Levitical and Aaronic are, are going to be considered synonymous here. Now, there's a technical difference in the Old Testament between uh, Aaronic and Levitical, in terms of the priests of ancient Israel. If you're a Levitical priest, you're from the tribe of Levi. And to be a priest, all it takes is that descendancy from from Levi. To be a a high priest, to hold the Aaronic priesthood, was something higher. It wasn't just to be a Levite, it was to be the seed of Aaron, the brother of Moses. If you think back to the Oath and Covenant of the Priesthood in section 84, that if we are uh, diligent in magnifying and receiving and obtaining these two priesthoods, then we become the sons of Moses and of Aaron. But he also talks about becoming the sons of Levi and being purified to offer and offering again in righteousness. So it's all coming together here. Sons of Levi, that's all of us. Sons of Moses and Aaron, well, that's all of us too. So Aaronic priesthood, Levitical priesthood, as far as we're concerned here, they're synonymous. Now later, 1843, I believe, Joseph will give a sermon where he talks about three types of priesthood, and he says Melchizedek, patriarchal, and Aaronic. Uh, so that can be confusing too. Well, in some ways, understand that everything, all of it, you could say there's only one, that it's Melchizedek, and that all priesthood is Melchizedek. We'll see a better name for it in just a moment. But that's the all-encompassing, overarching umbrella, Melchizedek priesthood. We recall that Aaronic priesthood was simply added to it as a stepping stone to help them overcome their altitude sickness. They, they couldn't climb Sinai as quickly as Moses could. So uh, that's okay. Uh, we'll, uh, there'll be some wander, wander, die along the way, but I'll give you the Aaronic priesthood as an appendage to the Melchizedek priesthood. Still same overarching umbrella. And same with the patriarchal priesthood. In some ways, that's two different approaches to receive it. Patriarchal priesthood, which we'll see explained a little bit more here in section 107, is simply the sense of passing down from father to son, from patriarch. That's the, where the word, well, father and patriarch is, is supposed to be synonymous here. Pater in Latin, okay? So there's father. And to see it passed down along those lines, there's a patriarchal priesthood being, being given. And for those like Abraham, uh, whose father, remember Abraham chapter 1, my fathers had turned from God. So I wanted the blessings of the fathers. I still want to tap into that Melchizedek priesthood. 
I'm just not going to receive it in a patriarchal kind of way. My father's in no position to be able to give it to me. So he receives priesthood from a, still under that large umbrella, but not in a patriarchal kind of path. So but when all is said and done, there is one priesthood, really. It is the authority and power of God. Here it is subdivided into two, a greater and a lesser, as it's described in section 84. So Melchizedek and Aaronic. Verse 2, why the first is called the Melchizedek priesthood is because Melchizedek was such a great high priest. And that he was. Now, in the, in the King James Version of the Bible, we don't completely understand why, but there's at least a hint that, well, he must have been important because he seems to outrank Father Abraham. It seems like Melchizedek received his through the patriarchal path, whereas Abraham received his in a different manner. But when Abraham comes to Melchizedek, the king of Salem, Jerusalem, and, and pays his tithing to him, ooh, there is a recognition of higher authority here. Now, we're left with that in King James, and we're kind of like, okay, I don't know much about Melchizedek. I mean, his name comes up again in the book of Hebrews as, as that's trying to differentiate between types of priesthood. It's all there, but just not enough, not clear enough to, to, to build an ecclesiology around it, okay? Now, this is another example of Joseph not like pulling rabbits out of his hat, not, not pulling uh, a, a church out of some obscure passage in the Bible, but rather receiving revelation from God, like 107, to explain things. And then us left later to look and go, oh yeah, there are hints of that in the Bible. Huh, who knew? But now, in fact, in Joseph Smith, it was far more than a hint in the Bible, because as he worked on the Joseph Smith translation, the, the role of Melchizedek just expands magnificently. To me, it says something that two of the people that we know least about in King James and most about, thanks to Joseph's uh, revelatory experiences, are Enoch, he who built Zion before the flood, and Melchizedek, he who built Zion after the flood. Can you get a feel of why Joseph would be so interested in those two? And why the Lord would be so generous in, in explaining and, and expanding their understanding of those two. Because Joseph, you need to be a, a Zion builder as well. You need to be an Enoch. You need to be a, a Melchizedek. Or at least a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. In the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 14, we learn this about Melchizedek. That he was a man of faith who wrought righteousness. And when a child, he feared God and stopped the mouths of lions and quenched the violence of fire. There's language like that in the book of Hebrews as it de describes or personifies faith in people. Well, now we see who, who the, that, that writer of Hebrews was talking about. There's Melchizedek for you. And thus, having been approved of God, he was ordained in high priest after the order of the covenant which God made with Enoch, it being after the order of the Son of God. Now, that's some language that we'll see back in section 107, but it connects Melchizedek to Enoch, and it connects Enoch back to the Son of God. We, we see the same thing with the symbol of the rainbow that we always associate with, with Noah, and yet the rainbow connects Noah to the covenant God made with Enoch, that just as Zion was caught up to heaven, there's the first half of the rainbow, so shall Zion return to the earth. That's the second half of the rainbow. Rainbows connect heaven and earth, right? And so Zion above meets Zion below. May the kingdom of God go forth so the kingdom of heaven may come. It's all coming together here. But to understand Melchizedek's role in this as a personification of that covenant, renewed again, Zion post-flood, uh, just like Zion pre-flood. Well, now it's Joseph Smith's turn. Uh, to establish Zion in his day. As he said himself, Noah came before the flood. I have come before the fire. Either way, we're trying to establish Zion, to build an ark of covenant that, that will preserve life here. Some beautiful parallels. Well, back to the JST of, of uh, Genesis 14, speaking of Melchizedek, and the order of the covenant which God made with him and with Enoch, this order of the Son of God, which order came not by man, nor the will of man, neither by father nor mother, neither by beginning of days nor end of years, but of God. You're, you don't receive priesthood just because you want it. You don't receive priesthood just because you're born into a certain line. There's a requirement for even patriarchal authority passed down father to son. There's still a worthiness that is required. 
a tapping into divine power. For God, having sworn unto Enoch and unto his seed with an oath by himself, here's God's oath and covenant of the priesthood, that everyone being ordained after this order and calling should have power by faith. Now think about this phrase and the list of powers that are described afterwards. To break mountains, to divide the seas, to dry up waters, to turn them out of their course, to put at defiance the armies of nations, to divide the earth, to break every band, to stand in the presence of God, to do all things according to his will, according to his command, subdue principalities and powers, and this by the will of the Son of God, which was from before the foundation of the world. That is Melchizedek priesthood. When I read those verses and I think of what I tried to do with the priesthood God has given me, oh, I, 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 I feel condemned by that oft-quoted phrase of Brigham Young. You are living far beneath your privilege. Back in section 84, when we talked about the difference between the, the Melchizedek and the Aaronic priesthood, between God and angels, between inner and outward, between godliness and, and, and something less, there's something about this this higher authority that is meant to, to bring us into the presence of God. If Aaronic ordinances are preparatory ordinances to eliminate sin from our lives, Melchizedek ordinances are meant to present us to God, to bring us into his presence, to part the veil. That, that we are dividing, we're moving mountains here, like, like President Nelson just described in conference, the faith to move those mountains. We're, we're, we're dividing the land. We are, we're turning rivers out of their course. And spiritually speaking, there are beautiful manifestations of that. As, as a missionary, I remember people, meeting people that were so set in their ways. They might, have been, it might as well have been a mountain. But with the power of the power, that's the word there, the power of God, exercised by faith in Christ, I watch those mountains move uh, to the, the rivers that are just trying to find the easiest way downhill, these meandering streams being channeled into a straight and narrow way that leads to God. I watched rivers move on my mission. I watched mountains move on my mission. I've been watching those things happen ever since. I've seen through the power of faith and the power of priesthood bonds be broken. I've seen people learn how to stand in the presence of God. Again, if Aaronic is to prepare, Melchizedek is to present, to present you to a loving Father in heaven that wants you to come home. That's what Melchizedek priesthood is for. That's what Melchizedek himself was able to accomplish among his people. One last verse from that Joseph Smith translation edition about him. His people wrought righteousness. They obtained heaven. They sought for the city of Enoch, which God had before taken, separating it from the earth, having reserved it unto the latter days or the end of the world. Ooh, reserved it to the latter days? Well, we latter day saints, are we preparing the earth to receive Zion again? Are we building it so God can bring it? Well, if we can follow Melchizedek's example, it, those who wrought righteousness, those who obtained heaven, then we'll obtain heaven too. We'll obtain heaven right here on earth. Yes, Melchizedek was such a great high priest. We need to be better high priests ourselves. Now, verse 3, before his day, it was called the holy priesthood after the order of the Son of God. And we saw that hinted at in that JST that we just discussed. Well, why change it? Verse 4 clarifies but out of respect or reverence to the name of the Supreme Being, to avoid the too frequent repetition of his name. They, the church, in ancient days, called that priesthood after Melchizedek, or the Melchizedek priesthood. Now that should, should pause us in our tracks for a moment when we think about the, the significance and sacredness of the name of God. Now I've had some people ask, well, wait a minute, then what was wrong with calling the church the Mormon church? Because weren't we protecting the name of deity then? Uh, and with President Nelson's emphasis that we need to use the full name of the church and that this is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And if you're going to shorten anything, don't remove the name of Jesus. 
get rid of Latter-day Saints, okay, that this is the church of Jesus Christ. Well, notice the, the one slight difference here. It's out of respect or reverence to the name of the supreme being. So it's not son in that longer title, but rather God in that longer title that we are trying to protect. Jesus Christ was willing to condescend and come to our level, uh, including the, the use of names. But in terms of our Father in heaven, the supreme being, he to whom Jesus always spoke so respectfully. When someone came to Jesus and called him good, and Jesus says, why would you call me good? There's only one, and that's my Father in heaven. There's something about, about the Almighty that we need to, to maintain. Well, I'll put it this way. Elder D. Todd Christofferson gave an incredible talk once called The Sense of the Sacred. I was moved by that. There is... He, he recognizes that we've lost something in modernity. And one of the things we've lost is that sense of the sacred, that, that deference, that respect, what brings us naturally to our knees. And to, for, I mean, to me, it's, it, when we hear of don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, as one of the Ten Commandments, there's something about taking his name in vain to the point that it cheapens it. When we give nicknames to people, it's often either because we're so close to them, we, we're buddy and buddy, or we're trying to reduce them in some way. That's why so many people who were attacking the church in the early days just called him Joe Smith, because Joe is taking it down a notch from Joseph, at least in their minds, and in Joseph's too. He never went by Joe. But to honor our Father in heaven by maintaining some of that deferential respect, if... If taking the name of God in vain, well, let's well, actually reverse it. I don't know if anybody says the phrase Melchizedek priesthood flippantly. That I would hope that we say it reverently, take it seriously. And if we do that with, with the nickname of the priesthood, if we do it with the one that protects the name of deity, I would assume that if we use the full name, and sometimes in sacred places we do, I think we would do it seriously and, and reverently then as well. But e so here's the thing. So even if in reverence we should not overly repeat the name of God, imagine how seriously he feels about it when it's taken irreverently, when it's taken in vain. We cannot afford to cheapen our relationship with deity. There needs to be reverence. There needs to be respect. There needs to be a sense of the sacred. And so... Maybe just quietly and humbly read silently to yourself verse 3. And think in your mind when you are about to officiate in the Melchizedek priesthood, just what you are doing and in whose name and by whose authority you are doing it. I remember once a talk that President Irene gave when he was talking about the sacrament and he began to repeat the sacrament prayer and only got maybe a few words into it before he stopped and said, you know, out of respect for that sacred language, that divinely revealed sacramental prayer, I'm not going to repeat the rest. And I just remember being struck by that, thinking, we repeat those words every week around the church. Oh, but they must not lose their sacred significance. Same with the beautiful title of the holy priesthood, as mentioned in verse 3. Brethren, next time you give a priesthood blessing and invoke the name Melchizedek, in terms of your authority. Oh, I hope that silently you can pause and reflect on whose priesthood this really is. Now, verse 5, all other authorities or offices in the church are appendages to this priesthood. So is it, is it three? Oh, no, that's actually two. Well, is it two? No, it's actually one. Everything else is an appendage to this priesthood. I actually loved what Elder Oaks said in that great talk about priesthood and women. Uh, as he described uh, the, the roles that women play in, in serving in God's name. And he said, that's priesthood. It has to be. And that just really struck me at the time. It was like, duh, how have we missed this all this time? By the way, he quoted so many earlier prophets. Almost, uh, I got the sense that he's like, he's trying to say, I'm not making this up just to appease a modern perspective. 
This is, we, this is the way it's always been. We just haven't understood it as well as we should. And I still don't think we completely do. But there's something beautiful there in verse 5, that everything else is an appendage to Melchizedek priesthood. So anytime you're magnifying a calling or serving in the church, anytime you are authorized to do something, it has to be priesthood authority because there's no other kind of authority out there. And what kind of authority is it? It's Melchizedek, big umbrella, or one of its appendages beneath it. Verse 6, but there are two divisions or grand heads. One is the Melchizedek priesthood. The other is the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood. And then we'll start to differentiate the offices within them. Kind of a taxonomy of, of priesthood authority here. Verse 7, the office of an elder comes under the priesthood of Melchizedek. So if we're making a chart here, let's put it under the Melchizedek side. Verse 8, the Melchizedek priesthood holds the right of presidency. It presides and has power and authority over all the offices in the church in all ages of the world to administer in spiritual things. Now remember, if Aaronic focuses on temporal things, no wonder here Melchizedek is, is associated with spiritual things. We'll see that phrase several more times in this revelation. Verse 9, the presidency of the high priesthood, after the order of Melchizedek, have a right to officiate in all the offices in the church. Remember, we've taken, seen these gradual steps towards this kind of leadership where Joseph uh, originally is the first elder of the church and a prophet, an apostle, a seer, a translator, an elder. Uh, but it takes time and then it, there's, okay, there's going to be three high priests that preside. It's going to be the presidency of the high priesthood. Well, and then that takes another step forward. Oh, that's the first presidency of the church, the presiding quorum. We'll see them clarified here in this revelation too. But they have the right to officiate in every other office. Verse 10, high priests after the order of the Melchizedek priesthood have a right to officiate in their own standing under the direction of the presidency in administering spiritual things. There's that phrase again. And also in the office of an elder, priest of the Levitical order, teacher, deacon, and member. So there's greater autonomy in the Melchizedek priesthood, able to officiate in your own standing. But it's not complete independence. Remember, we're always trying to prove contraries. And in this one, there is hierarchy, but there is also uh, democracy. We want all in involvement, a priesthood of all believers that Martin uh, Luther would have been uh, jealous of. But at the same time, there needs to be, this is a house of order. So it's under the direction of the presidency, but yes, a right to officiate in your own standing. And, and, it, and it's over all these lesser offices, elder, priest, teacher, deacon, member. Verse 11, an elder has a right to officiate in his stead when the high priest is not present. So that's still under Melchizedek uh, authority. There are times when I was in the bishopric and both the bishop and the other counselor were, were absent. And it, it gets really lonely on the stand. And there's too much going on. And you're trying to move the pulpit and you're trying to check on the priests if they, if they bless the sacrament correctly. And, uh -huh. and so it was always nice to invite a member of the elders quorum presidency to come join me. Okay? So the elder has a right to officiate in the place of a high priest when they're just not present. Verse 12, the high priest and elder are to administer in spiritual things. Third time we've seen that. Agreeable to the covenants and commandments of the church, kinds of things we saw back in section 20, that constitution, kinds of things we saw in section 84, the kinds of things we'll see here in 107. And they have a right to officiate in all these offices of the church when there are no higher authorities present. Now let's shift to the other side of the column. The second priesthood is called the priesthood of Aaron because it was conferred upon Aaron and his seed throughout all their generations. We get a hint of this patriarchal pathway, father to son, Aaron to his seed. Verse 14, why it is called the lesser priesthood is because it is an appendage to the greater or the Melchizedek priesthood and has power in administering outward ordinances. The Melchizedek was the inner ordinances, the sacred spiritual things. Aaronic then has the outward ordinances, the more temporal things. Verse 15, the bishopric is the presidency of this priesthood and holds the keys or authority of the same. That's why in, in priesthood quorums, there's a deacon's quorum president with keys. There's a teacher's quorum president with keys. There's a priest quorum president, but it's not a 16 year old boy. The priest quorum president is the bishop. And those who serve with him in the priest quorum aren't even called his counselors because the bishop already has his two counselors in the bishopric. In the presidency of the priest quorum, he has two assistants, okay? So there's a difference there. 
And then he repeats some of the things that we saw back in section 68 about a presiding bishop and, and is there a legal right to it if you're a direct descendant of Aaron versus you're a high priest in the Melchizedek priesthood and since you have that authority to officiate in every office below you, then you can serve as bishop uh, based on your high priesthood rather than your patriarchal lineage. So he says in 16 and 17, no man has a legal right to this office to hold the keys of this priesthood except he be a literal descendant of Aaron. But as a high priest of the Melchizedek priesthood has authority to officiate in all the lesser offices, we just saw that a column ago, he may officiate in the office of bishop when no literal descendant of Aaron can be found. Now, that's not just an automatic. He must be called and set apart and ordained unto this power by the hands of the presidency of the Melchizedek priesthood. And again, we talked about that at length in our discussion of section 68. In verse 18, the power and authority of the higher or Melchizedek priesthood is to hold the keys of all the spiritual blessings of the church. You remember our key word back in section 84 associated with Melchizedek priesthood was God and godly and the power of godliness manifest through its ordinances uh, as opposed to angels on that lesser level? Well, here the, word, the key word is spiritual. Spiritual things over and over and over. Spiritual blessings. And some of those spiritual blessings are listed in 19. To have the privilege of receiving the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. There's the knowledge of God that section 84 referred to. To have the heavens opened unto them. That goes, takes us back to that JST edition about Melchizedek himself. To commune with the general assembly and church of the firstborn. That's celestial kingdom according to section 76. And to enjoy the communion and presence of God the Father and Jesus the mediator of the new covenant. That is the authority of presentation, to bring us into the presence of God, to part the veil. That's what Melchizedek ordinances and authority are meant to accomplish. As opposed to verse 20, the power and authority of the lesser or Aaronic priesthood is to hold the keys of the ministering of angels, to administer in outward ordinances, the letter of the gospel, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, agreeable to the covenants and commandments. So can you picture those two side by side? Aaronic versus Melchizedek. Angels versus God. Outward versus inward. Letter versus spirit. Baptism of repentance, there's the baptism of water, compared to baptism of spirit, that is baptism by fire. To, to see these two priesthoods go hand in hand as they together bring us back into the presence of God. Justification on the one hand, sanctification on the other. Out of the, the pit, thanks to the Aaronic, and then up to the mountaintop, thanks to the Melchizedek. Now in verse 21, we've, we're going to need to organize ourselves. If these are the goals of the, the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods, and there still needs to be some kind of a structure to allow us to tap into the, these blessings and these powers. So in 21, of necessity, there are presidents or presiding officers growing out of or appointed of or from among those who are ordained to the several offices in these two priesthoods. It's of necessity. Somebody's got to be in charge. I mean, this vehicle has so much you know, towing capacity, so much cargo space, and plenty of seating for all of God's children to come join us. But somebody's got to sit behind the, the steering wheel. Somebody needs to help be in charge. And so how do we organize it along those ways? Verse 22, of the Melchizedek priesthood, three presiding high priests, chosen by the body, appointed and ordained to that office, and upheld by the confidence, faith, and prayer of the church, form a quorum of the presidency of the church. Now here in verse 22, we see the first presidency. And that day it's going to be Joseph and Sidney and Frederick. And I love what was said here about how we uphold them. The church, we sustain them. We lift our arms, just like Aaron and her lifted the arms of Moses. How do we do it? We uphold them by our confidence, our faith, and our prayer. Now take those three and ponder it. Remember earlier we talked about you need to be both worthy and capable? or worthy and competent, as, as we've heard from general authorities in our day. Well, if we, if we uphold them by our confidence, I think that's a nod to their capability. I mean, I look at the credentials of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve, and it's, it blows me away. I love what Elder Holland once said, that 
Uh, he's been around some smart people before. He's one of them, okay? His, his time at Yale uh, helps prove that. But as he just said, this is not just some kind of think tank. This is not some kind of corporate board of directors. He said, I've never been among a, a circle of people with more experience and greater intellect and, and more consecrated hearts. All that together, just their worldly credentials uh, would be enough to, for me to give them my confidence. Now their spiritual credentials, the way they live their lives, the goodness of their hearts and the meekness of their spirit, every time I've associated with any of them, whether from a distance, listening in a general conference, whether from some sweet and personal experiences, being able to meet a few of these great men in their high and holy callings, that's, oh, they are deserving of my faith. Yeah, I understand what I'm trying to do with these words here. If confidence is with competence, faith is with worthiness, and prayer puts it all together as I, as I lift my arms in hopes of lifting theirs, my prayers in their behalf which I have heard multiple prophets thank us for. It's one thing we can do to uphold them. Now, if 22 is the first presidency, 23 is the Quorum of the Twelve. The twelve traveling counselors are called to be the twelve apostles. Now, this is tricky because we remember in section 102, we had the Kirtland Stake High Council, and that describes other councils that can follow the same pattern, like, well, they'll need one down in Missouri as well. Well, if there's a council of 12 in Kirtland and a council of 12 in Missouri to go along with presiding three authorities over each, well, what about all these other branches all over the place uh, that have not yet gathered to these two centers of strength? And what about, if they're a standing council, what about those that can be on the move and those that can spread the gospel? There are some councils that emphasize perfecting the saints. There are, there's another council that's going to need to emphasize proclaiming the gospel. And that's the quorum of the 12 apostles. Here they're described as traveling counselors, but that's the quorum of the 12. And they're further defined in 23 as special witnesses of the name of Christ in all the world, thus differing from other officers in the church in the duties of their calling. We, we can talk about area 70s, for example, in, in, or area authorities, as opposed to general authorities. And the Quorum of the Twelve differ from other local officers, like a local stake high council, because they have general authority no matter where they go, no matter where they travel. They are traveling counselors. And more than that, they are special witnesses of the name of Christ in all the world, everywhere they go. There's the, they don't take days off from that responsibility. President Oaks uh, wrote a book early on in his ministry as an apostle, as he tried to wrap his mind and heart around that responsibility. What does it mean to be a special witness, not just of Christ, but of the name of Christ? Uh, some beautiful insights in that book, uh, in his holy name, to understand that his name is his authority, it's his kingdom, it's his priesthood, it's his church. And to be special witnesses of all of that in all the world, it's amazing that we have these 12 apostles, these 12 prophets, seers, and revelators, called to do just that. Now 24, they, the quorum of the 12, form a quorum equal in authority and power to the three presidents previously mentioned. Now hold on to that phrase. They, they're equal in authority to the first presidency. Now keep going, we'll come back to this thought. 25, the 70 are also called to preach the gospel and to be a special witnesses unto the Gentiles and in all the world, thus differing from other officers in the church in the duties of their calling. So there's, there's a difference here. There's going to be, the 70 have a fascinating history. There used to be quorums of the 70 within stakes, uh, and you could be called to be a 70 uh, on a local level. Uh, and be part of that, you kind of the missionary arm of, of, the local, uh, of a local stake. And that was eventually dissolved to create a unified, centralized uh, council of, or quorum of the 70 uh, that, that is headquartered in Salt Lake, again, for all the world. And over time, and we'll see this uh, mentioned in section 107 also, the number of those quorums of the 70 has increased dramatically. But what's the core of their calling? To be a special witnesses. Now, some have asked, wait, if the Quorum of the Twelve is supposed to be special witnesses and the Quorum of the Seventy are supposed to be 
as special witnesses, what's the difference there? And somebody asked that of Boyd K. Packer, and President Packer simply said, what's the difference between special and a special? Just an E. <laughs> and so it's like, okay, there's not some new form of witnessing uh, of the name of Christ. No, you're, you're, you're special, a special, your witnesses of, of, of God. But notice 26, and they form a quorum equal in authority to that of the 12 special witnesses or apostles just named. Now, this is where it gets really confusing, perhaps, but really interesting. We always make kind of a, a flow chart, an organizational chart, and it's got first presidency at the top, and then quorum of the 12 below them, and then uh, quorum of the 70 below them. But according to these verses, maybe it should be a horizontal one with equal signs in between. Because the Quorum of the Twelve is equal in authority to the First Presidency. And the Quorum of the Seventy is equal in authority to the Quorum of the Twelve. Well, wait a minute. This gets confusing then, because are we putting a steering wheel in all three seats then? Because, hey, we all have equal say. Well, let me skip ahead and show you that actually both models are needed here. 23, 4, 5, 6 is about the equality, the horizontal equality between these quorums. But turn a page... And look at verse 33. The twelve are a traveling presiding high council to officiate in the name of the Lord under the direction of the presidency of the church. Agreeable to the institution of heaven to build up the church, to regulate all the affairs of the same in all nations, first unto the Gentiles, secondly unto the Jews. Now there's a lot in verse 33 about the responsibilities of the quorum of the twelve. Okay, But the phrase I want to focus on is under the direction of the presidency of the church. You can see the same in verse 34. The 70 are to act in the name of the Lord under the direction of the 12, or the traveling high council. And what are they supposed to do? Building up the church, regulating all the affairs of the same in all nations, first unto the Gentiles, then to the Jews. So again we see that phrase, under the direction of. Now 33 and 34 is the model, the flow chart that we're used to. Uh, it's the vertical one, first presidency, under which is Quorum of the Twelve, under which is Quorum of the Seventy. In fact, there's some amazing moments in church history that really dramatize that. For example, when Harold B. Lee was, was in his final moments, and President Kimball and President uh, Romney both rushed to President Lee's bedside. Now, at the time, President Lee is still alive. And so, as presiding high priest and his counselor, Marion G. Romney, as equal in authority to him, right, they share in the keys of the kingdom, the presiding officer in that room, at least the one who was able to function, would have been President Romney. Uh, and under his, under his direction was the Quorum of the Twelve, namely in its, in its president, Spencer W. Kimball. But what was amazing is, so President Kimball runs in, and there's President Romney, and he says, President Romney, what would you have me do? You're, you're, I'm under your direction. Quorum of the Twelve, under the direction of the First Presidency. But as they were there talking, President Lee passed away. And in that instant, as soon as the President is gone, the Presidency is dissolved, right? And the counselors then renew their position, or resume their position of seniority within the Quorum of the Twelve. It happens in a heartbeat, or in this, with that last heartbeat. And, and because of, again, we're still equal in authority, so we haven't lost anything. There is no more First Presidency right now, but since the Quorum of the Twelve is equal in authority to the First Presidency, we still have the keys, and the Church can still move forward. Uh, there's not a, a 164th of a second without authority, Elder Holland said later. But, but there's a reversal, and this is the part that's fascinating to me. A moment before, it was President Kimball, Apostle, saying to President at Romney, First Presidency, what would you have me do? And with that final heartbeat and the dissolving and the resuming position, all of a sudden now it was President Romney recognizing President Kimball as his quorum president and said to him, President Kimball, what would you have me do? You catch that? Yeah, I mean, just dramatic moment in church history. But to see the way things, uh, the, the under the direction of it functioned without a, a, a moment of lost authority. There was an equality and a hierarchy all at the same time. There's another uh, instance that may not be quite as dramatic, but for those who were present, it felt like it was. Uh, this was when, in the late 90s, 1990s, 
the quorum, the presidency of the 70 began meeting with the quorum of the 12 in their Tuesday meetings in the Salt Lake Temple. And that seems fitting. After all, they are equal in authority, right? We need to get on the same page. We need to understand what's going on okay, so we can lead the kingdom of God in righteousness. So we can build up the church and regulate all the affairs of the same, okay? As we saw in, these, in this revelation. Well, they, they all, all come together. President L. Alden Porter of, was the, president of the, the senior president of the 70. And he and the other six presidents of the 70 come in. And there's the Quorum of the Twelve with Boyd K. Packer as the acting president of that quorum. And President Packer turned to President Porter and said, What do you have for us today? To which President Porter responded, President Packer, you are the Twelve. We are the Seventy. What would you have us do. You catch that? It's almost like President Packer was leaning into the equal in authority half. Well, what, what can we do for you? And then President pa uh, Porter was leaning into the under the direction of half. It was like, no, we're, you're the 12, we're the 70. What do you want us to do? Elder Marlon K. Jensen was in the presidency of the 70 at the time too. And he said when he was there in that moment, it's one of those little moments that will never get written down in church history. Well, I guess it was. <laughs> but I don't think I've ever felt more strongly the power of the priesthood and the power of the leadership of these two of the three leading quorums of the church as I did in that moment. And to me, what I find so moving there is again this recognition of of the equality, but also of the hierarchy. Now, like I said, it's the hierarchical side that that we're used to, okay? It's under the direction of. How, in fact, I don't even know how to draw the organizational chart any other way, uh, but how do you combine the two models? How do you make something hierarchical democratic or vice versa? How do you make something vertical into something horizontal? Are we just gonna go diagonal? <laughs> I don't know. But, but if you can somehow, this is the pr ultimate proving of contraries when it comes to church organization. And I would also say family organization. And that's really where I want to, want to get to in this discussion. Because we're not members of the First Presidency or the, or the Quorum of the Twelve or the Quorum of the Seventy. Uh, and probably never will be. But we are, many of us, husbands and wives. We are, we're in a position of authority within the family. And how does that work? Again, if we stick with the language of Section 107, how do we combine and a, an equal in authority model with an under the direction of model. Or if we take the proclamation to the world on the family, how do we reconcile that it states that a husband's role is to preside, which suggests kind of a hierarchical vertical setup. And yet the other phrase, that husbands and wives are meant to work as equal partners in the leadership of the family and all that they do. And so, Ooh, that, that's the horizontal model there, uh, the equality. So how do I do both? I've joked before that wouldn't it be interesting if, yes, there can only be one steering wheel in the vehicle, right? If you had two, uh, uh, the wheel's going to go in different directions, the car can't split apart. We, we're in this together. So there needs to be one final say of we're going to turn left. But in the spirit of equality, to balance out that hierarchy, can you imagine if in the passenger side, that's where the brake and the gas pedal were? I, I love the, just the mental image of that to think, nope, we're going to go left. And the other person says, well, then we're not going to go anywhere because I control the brake. We're going to, and I, I want to go this way. So I'm going to hit the gas and we're going to go forward. And the other one's like, well, if we're going to go forward, we're not going in your direction. I, I, now we're at this impasse. We're at a standstill and, and, and we're never going to be able to get the car moving forward and in any direction until the two people in those front seats come to be one. Until a first presidency and a quorum of the 12 and quorums of the 70 become fully one, then equal in authority and under the direction of can never coexist. And more importantly, on a personal level, the same is true in a marriage that until husbands and wives can become truly one with each other, and ideally one with the Lord, only then will this under the direction of hierarchy presiding come together with this equality, equal partners in all things. Uh, I love what Elder L. Tom Perry said, that the, a wife is not the vice president of the family. No, 
husbands and wives must lead the family as equal partners. I love what Barbara Morgan has taught about this as far as priesthood and women is concerned. That in, in the church, it's much more hierarchical. There's a president and counselors. Uh, but in a family, it's not the dad is the president and the mom is the first counselor. No. And in fact, if you think of, I love what she describes, that the temple is kind of the ultimate hybrid model of this because it, it combines both, both worlds uh, or both systems of organization. There is a temple president with counselors, but there is also a temple matron and the temple matron also has counselors and it's all these three couples that lead the temple. It's fascinating the way these, these two worlds come together. And so on a purely kind of ecclesiastical side, it's this president and counselors hierarchy. But in a patriarchal side, in a family organization, it's, it's husbands and wives. And, and like I said, it coming together with president and matron, each with counselors, it's kind of mind-blowing. It really is amazing stuff. And where you really see that function, where the rubber hits the road, is when you have to make up your mind. Which, well, and I say that in, a, in the singular. There are two minds going on, you know, husband and wife. There are three minds in the first presidency and 12 more in the Quorum of the Twelve and all the others in the Quorum of the Seventy. But they have to become one mind, which Paul described as the mind of Christ. But how do we get there? How do we make up our mind uh, when there's a bunch of minds uh, that are supposed to come into one? That's the part I skipped when I went from equal in authority to to under the direction of. And I love that what's right in between them is what they have to do together all the time, namely make decisions. I've never seen a better passage of scripture on how groups or couples or councils need to become one in their decision making than this. Back to verse 27. Every decision made by either of these quorums must be by the unanimous voice of the same. That is, every member in each quorum must be agreed to its decisions in order to make their decisions of the same power or validity one with the other. There, that key there in verse 27 is unanimity. And when you think about hierarchy doesn't require unanimity. Somebody calls the shot at the end of the day. Okay? The coach calls the play and the players are just supposed to execute it. The president, it, this is like executive order. Forget checks and balances. Okay? It's, yeah, this is what's going to be done. But that's not, that doesn't follow the equal in authority side. So to, to emphasize the equal in authority, it, there has to be unanimity here. Uh, that's going to take a while. That's going to take a lot of discussion and coming to understand one another's perspective. And all these, multi, out, e pluribus unum, out of many, one, well, it has to be only unum by the end. It has to be unanimous. Otherwise, there's just not as, as much power. There's not as much validity because there's some people dragging their feet. Again, that's why this principle of scattered revelation in a ward council is so important because as everyone brings their piece of the puzzle and as the presiding officer realizes his or her role is to help them assemble the puzzle, to coax out of them the piece that God has given them and then figure out collectively, what's the picture we're looking at? What, what does it show on the box? Because the, the box is in, in heaven. God's the one that sees that. Okay? Our job then is to put it together until we all have buy-in, which we should buy then because we all contributed to the final decision. See, that's the, the better version of just mere delegation where it's a, a, a presiding authority uh, with everyone else under their direction barking out orders saying this is how it's going to be done and this is what I'm delegating all of the, the, the kind of sub-responsibilities to be. It's like, no, we're reversing the whole thing. You come with your piece of the revelatory puzzle. Let's bring it all together. And then, well, yeah, we're all on the same page. Yes, there's greater power. There's greater validity because of that unanimity. Now, verse 28, a majority may form a quorum when circumstances render it impossible to be otherwise. So I get it that sometimes not all 12 can be present. Not all the 70s or all the, the first presidency or all the quorum of the 12 can come together. So a majority will do. That's what a quorum of the quorum would be. But then verse 29, unless this is the case, unless you obtain unanimity, their decisions are not entitled to the same blessings which the decisions of a quorum of th three presidents were anciently, who were ordained after the order of Melchizedek and were righteous and holy men. 
Now, that idea of righteous and holy men is key because it's not enough just to become one horizontally with each other. You have to be one vertically with God. This horizontal will help on the capability side, the competence, but the vertical one is the worthiness side of things, righteous and holy men. And that's where verse 30 comes in. The decisions of these quorums, or either of them, are to be made in all righteousness, in holiness. Okay, so righteous and holy men, well, your decisions need to reflect that. They need to be made in righteousness. They need to be made in holiness. In fact, they need to be made in lowliness of heart, meekness, and long-suffering. So there's this next list. It's like these three waves of attributes that the Lord is going to give. The first is righteous and holy. The decisions have to uh, be that because the decision makers have to be that. Now, how do you get there? Uh, in fact, how do righteous and holy men become one? The Lord said that earlier. If you're not one, you're not mine. And a decision that's not one is not going to be a decision that I would claim as mine either. So there's the unanimity of 27. But righteousness and holiness, how do you become one there? Through your lowliness of heart, your meekness, and your long-suffering. I think that's what makes it near impossible for Congress to ever compromise and become one. Can you imagine if they couldn't pass legislation until it was unanimous? We never get anything done in the country. Miraculously, we get a ton done in the church. But it requires an incredible amount of lowliness, meekness, and long-suffering. And those are the, the attributes that define compromise. The attributes that are required for unanimity. I'm not trying to beat my chest and say it has to be this way. I mean, can you, it's mirac. I'll put it this way. Members of the first president of the Quorum of the Twelve, because of their, their competence, right? We can uphold them with our confidence because they're incredible. Most of them have spent a lifetime in the public or private sector running things. Uh, university presidents and, and do doctors and surgeons and lawyers and judges and Supreme Court judges and, and it's amazing what they do. But you take like 12 alpha males <laughs> and put them in the same room, mm, it's amazing that there isn't this kind of vying for, for superiority, that there is a recognition of total equality here. And the, the most junior member of the Quorum of the Twelve holds all the same keys that the senior member of the Quorum of the Twelve does. And while there is deference and respect, there's also a shared sense of, of admiration, of unity, that's borne out by humility and meekness. And however long it takes for them to come to be one, that's the long-suffering side of things. We may not see eye to eye. There was a great talk that President Nelson gave that, where he basically was talking about this unanimity that's required. And he said, that's when we finally know we've, uh, we've arrived at the will of the Lord. We finally agree with one another. And we're not, it's not a bunch of yes men that are like, oh, well, that's the prophet and he's in charge. And so, yes, yes, I'll do whatever you say. And no, it is, it's wrestling with these issues based on their different perspectives and their different experiences and their different areas of expertise. It's amazing who we're guided by. Do we claim them to be infallible? No. That's why we uphold them with our faith, not with absolute knowledge. But oh, I would say this, and I've said this to many students in the past that have wrestled and struggled with, I just don't know if I agree with this policy. I said, that's fine, you, you can disagree. But first ask yourself, have you done as much homework as they have? with the caliber of conversation partners that they have. I've never met anyone that can, that can claim that. And perhaps more importantly, do you live as con consecrated a life as they do, as you're making up your decisions, as opposed to how they're making their decisions? Wow, who are my conversation partners? Is it just media, or even worse, social media? Am I just licking my finger and trying to figure out where the winds of popular opinion are blowing this week or this news cycle, as opposed to people like John the Baptist who are not reeds shaken in those winds, only trying to understand the will of God? They really are incredible. And as I've said to my students that are concerned over their fallibility, I always say that unanimity helps offset fallibility if their decisions have to be unanimous 
And the only way to get there is through lowliness and meekness and long suffering. Oh yes, their unanimity helps offset their fallibility. Well, again, how do we get there? There's another list of attributes. The first list was righteousness and holiness. Second list was lowliness and meekness and long suffering. Third list, it's all here in verse 30, is faith and virtue and knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. Because the promise is, he continues in 31, if these things abound in them, these Christ-like attributes, they shall not be unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord. Of course you won't be unfruitful in God's knowledge. You, you know the Lord. And so, of course, you know the Lord's mind on these issues. And how did you come to know the Lord? By becoming like him. That's what Paul meant by, we have obtained the mind of Christ. We know what he would want us to do. We've arrived at that understanding. We now have unity, and better yet, unanimity, with the ultimate leader of the quorum. And that's Jesus Christ himself. How do we get there? Through this list of divine attributes. Now, I've sometimes asked my institute students, does that list ring any bells? In fact, not just the list, but the order of the list. And typically, it's my return missionaries that'll raise their hand and go, whoa, light bulb comes on. That's section four. That, okay. What we, when that early revelation to Joseph Smith Sr., you know, we're, we've got to roll up our sleeves and, and thrust, thrust in our sickle with our might. And if you have desires to serve, you're called to the work. And, and remember these attributes in all that you do. And it's the same list in the same order. Faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, and so on. And they're pretty proud of themselves. And I go, oh, awesome. That's a great first step. You found the precedent for, for this verse. But what's the precedent for section four? If this language draws upon section four, where does section four get its language from? And that's where it's like, wait, what? And nobody seems to know. Well, the answer there is 2 Peter chapter 1. Because in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter talks about obtaining the divine nature of truly becoming like Jesus Christ, attribute by attribute. And he uses the same list of attributes in the same order but the best part about Peter is he really does make it look like there is an order present. And there's a cumulative crescendo into becoming like Christ. And so when he says, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge, and to your knowledge temperance, and to your knowledge patience, and so on. And, and if you take the time, I think we, if I, it's been a long time, I think we did that back in section four, uh, of why that particular order. Of you you got to start with faith. But your faith better be virtuous so that the Holy Ghost can be with you. And, and you can do all that and still not really know what you're doing. you got the worthiness but not the competence. So we better add some knowledge here. But don't let the knowledge go to your head. Keep it temperate. okay? And if someone else is further back on the path, be patient with them. Throughout it all, try to become godly. But also don't lose sight of, again, people further, in the, further back in the path. So have brotherly kindness. Over it all, charity. The greatest of all of these is charity. Again, the, the, the order there is profound. But what I also love about Peter, because so often when we, when we find a precedent, when there's some allusion to earlier scripture, it's almost like the Lord is hoping that we know the whole story. Okay? It's like he said in section 103 about, hey, remember uh, after much tribulation come the blessings? I said that before. And then the kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, go back and read the rest. Read the verses that surround it and it'll blow your mind. He does that so often in scripture. Just a hint, but read the rest of the story that surrounds it. Well, in Peter, obtaining the divine nature, how does that end? It's not mentioned here, but, or in section four, but the way Peter ends his discussion of that is with having your calling and election made sure. Boom, that's mind blowing. Okay? That's obtaining the mind of Christ. It's obtaining the character of Christ. It's fully trying to be like Jesus. And in the end of that, it all culminates in having one's calling and election made sure. Now here we're talking about decision making. But coming to know the Lord, coming to know his mind and will on certain things, in a way, what the, wouldn't you want your decisions to have their calling and election made sure? Like, I know this is the right thing to do. Uh, it, it's clear, and, and nothing's going to get in the way of that. And, and I love that thought of, man, if I can just have my 
decisions, calling an election made, sure, then there's no fear anymore. I can totally march forward with faith. Well, how do I get there? This is how you do it. The two streams that flow into this river are unanimity on the part of the decision makers and Christ-like attributes all along the way to their compromise and their and their receipt of revelation, and they're, they're coming to, to understand the mind of Christ. They won't be unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord because they've come to know him as they've come to be like him. Oh, I hope this makes sense, especially for every quorum or council that's trying to make up their mind, and even more importantly, for every family council, for every husband and wife, that are trying to lead their families in righteousness and have big decisions to make. How do we know where to move or what job to take? How do we know what our family size should be? How do we know anything as far as raising our children in righteousness, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? These verses here are, are my favorite I've shared them with many a couple that I see sometimes struggling in their, in their ability to compromise. Because here's the problem. For many couples, compromise is, just means taking turns, not compromising. Well, you got your way last time, so it's my turn to call the shots. You got to sit in the steering wheel uh, last week. It's my turn. And yes, this, the, the brake and the gas are on my side too. So we're going where I want, how fast I want. And you sit there. I did it last week. Okay, I sat there quiet. You see the problem there? That's not compromise. It's taking turns, not compromising. Yes, half the time you're not mad, but the other person is, and then you just switch off. So while you're only mad 50% of the time, somebody's mad 100% of the time. And that's a lousy way to make decisions. It's not a very loving marriage. So somehow we have to change this. Somehow we have to follow the example here. Everything we've studied in these middle verses in section 107, that a husband and wife need to be equal in authority, even if there's ever some kind of, and this can trade back and forth depending on the situation sometimes, uh, even if the, when there is a, some kind of hierarchical presiding under the direction of, there always needs to be unanimity and Christ-like attributes in getting your decisions to have their calling and election made sure. This was actually dramatized to me, uh, I, I have to say it miraculously, because I don't know of any other word to describe it. It was a miracle as I see it. It happened back in Tennessee. We were, my wife and I were at a fireside with a couple of friends of ours. Wonderful couple. Uh, the, the husband was just a really, really close friend of mine. I love him to this day. And we were at this fireside just listening to an apostle uh, speak uh, via satellite and just rejoicing in the whole message. Now, in the middle of the message, I wasn't thinking, I was focused, I was trying to pay attention to the apostle, and I had one of the most clear impressions I've ever had in my life. For me, most of my spiritual impressions are more of a confirmation, a kind of a, a more generalized, you're getting warmer, so move in that direction. Or you're moving, you're getting colder, so move away from that one, okay? The light is growing brighter and brighter under the perfect day, but it's not necessarily like specific language or, or direction saying this is what you have to do. Okay? I'm more of a, an, Oliver, an Oliver Cowdery, like you better study that in your mind and then ask me if you're right, okay? And I'll let you know. Well, this one, I wasn't asking anything. I didn't, I didn't know I, was, I needed to know anything. I was just learning at the feet of an apostle. And in the middle of it, out of the blue, it was like revelation by dictation. And I don't even know if my friend knows this story. I don't know if he watches these, so it might still be news to him. But I had the clearest impression. Number one, your friend's going to ask you for a priesthood blessing tonight. And number two, you are not to give it to him. And it was so clear. I was like, wait, what? Uh, the first half, okay, well, maybe he's going through something hard and he'll want a blessing. I didn't know if he would, but, but the second... Don't bless him. That is not your... Wow. I've always thought about, the, do I have the power of the priesthood? But that was an instance of, do I have the permission of the priesthood? And that time, I did not have the permission. And it wasn't on any unworthiness on my side. It was, no, you're not allowed to give this good brother a blessing. And it, it 
it kind of rocked me. I think I lost sight of what the apostle was talking about for a while. And I'm just sitting with this revelation going, what do I do with this? Um, if number one happens, how do I navigate the explaining number two? Well, the fireside ended and we were just chatting afterwards and so on. And, and I was kind of waiting for it. Like, okay, when's he going to ask me for this blessing? And we kept talking and, and it never came up. He didn't ask for anything. And it was like, I was kind of stalling, like giving him time or an opportunity. I don't know. Uh, I was trying to honor the revelation I received. But I didn't. But... And then after a time, it just was like, okay, I guess we're out of things to talk about and no, nothing. So I must have gotten my wires crossed or something. That, that's common for hum, human beings. And so we just got up and like, hey, I'm so glad to be with you. Amazing fireside. We'll, we'll, see you, we'll see you soon. And we both went out to the parking lot to get into our cars. I got into my car and was ready to turn it on and shift into reverse when, and again, I'm thinking, what? I was off. I really thought he was going to ask me for a priesthood blessing. It's like, well, at least now I don't have to turn him down. Okay, that's a relief. And as I was about to shift into reverse, I get this knock on my window and turn, and there he is. And I rolled down my window. I'm like, yeah, it, everything okay? And he just said, I, I hate to bother you. I know you're busy, but do you have any time to give me a priesthood blessing? I'm like, okay, there's the first half. He did ask me for a blessing just like the Spirit told me he would. How do I break it to him that, <laughs> no, God refused. <laughs> it's like, so instead I just said, I kind of played dumb, and I said, oh, you need a priesthood blessing? I mean, I'm always happy to give people blessings, except right now. Um, what, what's going on? And it was so interesting as he described to me the situation he was in, with a major family decision to make. Here we are in section 107, right? How are decisions made? And he just, he's such a meek, he's one of the meekest, humblest, he's an Israelite in whom there is no guile. I love this guy, this friend of mine. And, and they don't get much better. And he just wanted to know clearly the Lord's will because his, his decision was going to affect his family uh, in major ways. And he just didn't want to get it wrong. And so he wanted that priesthood blessing to help reassure him that this is what you, you should be doing. And as I sat there wondering, how do I say no? I asked him, um, what's your wife feel about all this? And, and she's, I mean, not one whit behind. Okay, equal partners, yeah, they're equally awesome. And I just asked, how, what's your wife think about all this? And, and he's just like, I just, I don't want to pressure with that. I, I, I know that I, this is a decision I've just got to make and, and because here's what I was saying. I said, rather than a priesthood blessing right now, why don't you and your wife talk more about this, since it's a family decision with family consequences? Um, and as you ponder that, I mean, come back to me sometime. I'd, I'd be happy to give you a blessing. But for now, why don't you and your wife talk more about this? And it was so interesting. This friend of mine, in all his beautiful meekness, just began to weep. And he said, I'm sorry. I knew I shouldn't have asked you for a priesthood blessing. It's like I'm using the priesthood to make up my mind for me. And that's, that's not right. I guess he was Oliver Cowdery too. <laughs> okay, it's like, I just wanted the, the Lord to tell me through a priesthood blessing what I should do. And you're right. I shouldn't have asked you. This is on me. And I've got to know for myself what to do. And so you're right. I'm not going to ask for this blessing. I'm, and he was like thinking out loud. He said, I'm going to go to the temple tomorrow and I'm going to stay all day long if I have to. And I'll just do session after session after session. Or I'll like set up camp in the celestial room and just stay and, and wrestle with the Lord until I know what I'm supposed to do for my family. And right as he said that, with, with a boldness that surprised even me, I said to him, you're not listening to me. What's your wife going to be doing while you're at the temple all day? Home with the kids? This is a family decision with family consequences. And you, the two of you have to decide this together. I'm not giving you a priesthood blessing because you married your blessing. And the two of you need to become the one of you on this. It, it has to be unanimous for there to be power and validity. There has to be lowliness and meekness and long suffering. And you both have those attributes in spades. Lean into those Christ-like attributes, but lean into each other and become one with each other and one with God so that you know what that one decision should be. 
to me, it was a profound experience. I believe for him and for them, it was as well. But I've never forgotten the reality of that truth, that you married your blessing. Or in presiding quorums, you were called into your blessing. Yes, you can receive outside blessings as well, but unanimity and Christ-like attributes is how we come to be one and to know the mind of God. As I, that's the family council version. The church council version is, is equally profound. To me, the best place I've ever seen it, again, I loved what President Nelson said about we know where we've arrived when we finally have arrived with each other. But there was, I'll put it this way, um, if I can squeeze it in, I'll even try to, to add the YouTube video to this YouTube video so you can watch it right here. It's amazing. If not, you'll have to you Google it and you'll be able to find it easy. It was a press conference right when uh, Elder Quentin L. Cook was called to the Quorum of the Twelve. And President Irene was the one leading this kind of press conference. And a reporter asked him a question about Harvard and Stanford uh, because uh, Elder Irene was at both. And uh, Elder Cook was at Stanford, and it's like, is the church leaning towards kind of Ivy League, uh, or just kind of this level of intellect? It's like, well, the answer is no. Whoever the Lord calls, he qualifies. But a lot of people, he's been qualifying for a long time before he calls them. Again, we're upholding them by confidence, and these are incredibly competent uh, servants of the Lord. But here's the interesting thing about what Elder, Hall, excuse me, Elder Irene explained. I, I loved his, his answer here. He basically described his time of, of growing in competence when he was at Harvard. And his PhD in business was studying decision making. It was studying how do large organizations make complex decisions? And is there a better way of doing that uh, for government, for business, for whatever? He said, well, he was, I believe this is when he was president of Ricks College in Idaho, what's now BYU-Idaho. And he was at a meeting of a council I believe it was a church board of education meeting. So prophets and apostles and, and auxiliary presidents, presidents and so on. And he said, it was like, ooh, goody. My whole PhD work, I studied how large organizations make complex decisions. And here's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a large organization, making very complex decisions. And I get to watch. Well, he said it was the strangest thing ever. And, and just to watch the, the, the conversation unfold was striking to him for the, because it wasn't just yes men agreeing. It was prophets, seers, and revelators disagreeing, forcefully giving their very best counsel. Remember we saw that when Frederick G. Williams was called, that you need to be faithful in counsel, give it the best you've got, and then stand in the office to which you've been called. Uh, so proactivity as well as deference, how do I prove those contraries? Under the direction of, along with equal in authority, how do I prove those contraries? Well, he was watching it take place. And he was watching the Spirit begin to work on all of them as, as e pluribus unum. As out of many opinions, a single point of view began to emerge. Uh, amazing what took place. By the end of the press conference, uh, President Iron was saying, Harvard, Stanford, forget about it. <laughs> There's something else going on here. And that something else is amazing. Now, jumping back to section 107, we've tried to balance equal in authority with under the direction of. Well, let's get back to these quorums in verse 35. The 12 being sent out, holding the keys to open the door by the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, first unto the Gentiles, then unto the Jews. They hold those keys of the kingdom collectively, and they're opening the doors for the nations of the earth to come into the kingdom of God. In verse 36, the standing high councils at the stakes of Zion form a quorum equal in authority in the affairs of the church and all their decisions to the quorum of the presidency or to the traveling high council. Now, this is just the preliminary step. We've grown beyond that verse in our day, where at that time it's like, well, there's, there's e equality between the decisions of the quorum or the council in Kirtland and the high council in Missouri and the, and the quorum of the 12 going forth. 
I get this is still line upon line, and it's, and it's not until later where it's, no, this is just like the, remember how we saw that? There was a presidency in Kirtland and a presidency in, in Missouri, and it, it took a revelation to clarify, oh, no, no, the first president, the presidency of the high priesthood is over everything, okay, all the others. And it will be clarified as we go on that, oh, the Quorum of the Twelve really is over uh, in authority, all these stake high councils. Okay, it's not just, hey, well, we had 12 people too, so we're just as good as you are. Uh, yeah, you're just as good, but you don't have as much authority. Okay, you're, you're local, not general. But there is something to be said here, even for modern day, where there's, it's amazing the degree of autonomy that can take place within a stake. And that one stake may run things a little differently from another stake, and that's totally okay, because the stake presidency and the, and the high council there can become unanimous and follow Christ-like attributes and receive the will of the Lord for their stake. And there are even times where a presiding authority can defer to that. Elder Bednar talked about that when he was stake president in Arkansas. And a general authority was saying, hey, I'm going to come down. I want you to gather all your members. And, and President Bednar, Bednar had the guts to say, I, I'll do that if you, finally, if you say that's what you want done. But I, can I first be faithful in counsel before I defer uh, and say that I don't think that's a good idea? Please help me, or let me help you understand the, the circumstances financially of our stake and their spiritual faithfulness, that if you call them to come together, they will, but they're going to have to lose probably two days of work to be able to travel this far. This is a massive stake geographically. And for them to come when they can't afford to, to be able to hear your message, is there any other way we can do this? And the general authority, bless his heart, also had the meekness and loneliness of heart to realize you are right. And I will defer to your decision, President, because I think you understand things on the ground better than I do. But really beautiful how that took place. Now, verse 37, the high council in Zion form a quorum equal in authority in the affairs of the church and all their decisions to the councils of the twelve at the stakes of Zion. So this is more speaking of each individual stake high council. And again, the autonomy that can exist between them. 38, it is the duty of all the traveling high council to call upon the 70 when they need assistance to fill the several calls for preaching and administering the gospel instead of any others. We do that on the general level now, where so often it will be a, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve that brings a member of the Seventy with them. And as the kingdom of God has grown across the earth, the number of apostles hasn't, but the number of Seventies sure has. And we'll see more of that at the end, by the end of this section. But often now there will be a member, a general authority Seventy, that uh, brings with him as his junior companion, an area Seventy. That, that is more familiar with things in that, local, in that local area. You sense an increasing need to keep delegating down, and, that, and that's happening in our day. My, my parents said that when they were in college, they, they called the church office building and found out, I think, the favorite pie of one of the apostles. And they went up on his birthday and like were hanging out with him, and here's the pie, elder. And I thought, man, wouldn't that be cool? Uh, the church has just grown exponentially since then, and, it, and so the delegation keeps going further and further. And, and that's according to the will of the Lord, too. In verse 39, it is the duty of the twelve in all large branches of the church to ordain evangelical ministers as they shall be des designated unto them by revelation. And by evangelical ministers, we mean patriarchs. In each of the stakes of Zion, there is typically an evangelical minister, a patriarch that is designated by revelation. Uh, up until, I don't know how long ago they made this change, but for most of the history of the church, it was a member of the Quorum of the Twelve that did that, that called every patriarch in the church. But again, it is evidence of this increasing delegation. Uh, it is a stake presidency now that can submit a name. It still is uh, approved on the highest levels of the church, but to call a stake patriarch, a stake evangelical minister. And with this idea of patriarchs is when you see this shift to a more patriarchal pathway to priesthood. And that begins in verse 40. The order of this priesthood was confirmed to be handed down from father to son. There's the patriarchal path. And rightly belongs to the literal descendants of the chosen seed to whom the promises were made. And then he gives an example of this line. 41, this order was instituted in the days of Adam and came down by lineage in the following manner. From Adam to Seth, who was ordained by Adam at the age of 69 years, was blessed by him three years previous to his, Adam's, death, and received the promise of God by his father that his posterity should be the chosen of the Lord and that they should be preserved unto the end of the earth. 
So because of Cain slaying Abel, it's the tragedy for that first family that they lost two sons that day, one physically and the other spiritually. But as Seth uh, takes the place of his older brother Abel, is blessed by his father that his posterity should be chosen. So father to son to posterity. This is a patriarchal pathway of priesthood. 43, because he, Seth, was a perfect man. His likeness was the express likeness of his father, insomuch that he seemed to be like unto his father in all things and could be distinguished from him only by his age. By the way, Joseph Smith said the same thing about the, fa the father and the son in the first vision, that th there's never been a better example of like father and like son. But a close second, I suppose, is Adam and Seth. In 44, it continues down this, down the posterity, Enos, Verse 45, Canaan, 46, Mahalalel, 47, Jared, 48, Enoch. And speaking of Enoch, verse 49, he saw the Lord. He walked with him. He was before his face continually, and he walked with God 365 years, making him 430 years old when he was translated. Again, he's pretty quick going from father to son, but uh, I got to pause for a moment on my friend Enoch since he's trying to establish, or he's successfully established Zion in his day. And I'm trying desperately to do the same in mine. From there, in verse 50, it goes to Methuselah, 51 to Lamech, 52 to Noah. And then 53, three years previous to the death of Adam. Uh, we saw that about Seth, that he, that was when his blessing came. Three years previous to his death, Adam called Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, and Methuselah, this whole, here's the patriarchal lion all the way down, who were all high priests with the residue of his posterity who were righteous into the valley of Adam on Diamond, and there bestowed upon them his last blessing. I always love to see those pictures at like presidential inaugurations where it shows the, the incoming president with all the living post uh, or past presidents. There's just something, as a historian, I kind of geek out over pictures like that, where it's like, whoa, we've got, there's some serious executive experience there on the stand. Well, imagine this one, where there is Adam himself nearing the end of his incredibly long life and to have all, all his righteous posterity. This is preview of coming attractions, right? We saw that back in section 27, that that great last sacrament meeting will be at Adam on Diamond. We're coming full circle now. And the end is approaching the beginning and vice versa. Uh, and here is Adam with his righteous posterity and, and then this line of authority, father to son to grandson to great grandson and on and on and on. Okay? And then, verse 54, the Lord appeared unto them. They rose up and blessed Adam. They called him Michael, the prince, the archangel. They recognized him for who he really was. To see Jesus as Jehovah, to see Adam as Michael, the archangel, connecting heaven and earth. Uh, again, that's, that'll come full circle as well. We saw that in section 88, that Michael will gather his armies, and this, this is Armageddon, uh, this is Gog and Magog. It, it, this is the eternal battle of good versus evil. And to see it laid out at the very beginning through a patriarchal pathway of priesthood authority, to set at defiance the armies of the nations, to move the mountains and turn the rivers out of their course, to break the bands, to, to bring people into the presence of God. God is with them. The Lord has appeared. In 55, the Lord administered comfort unto Adam. I wonder what he means by that, to administer comfort. It's one thing to, to comfort someone, to give comfort, but to administer, that seems like a priesthood term to me. And is that part of this, of seeing the righteous posterity and the patriarchal priesthood passed down, that the world is in good hands? My posterity is in good hands, they're in holy hands that will bring them back to the hand of God. He administered comfort and said unto him, I have set thee to be at the head. A multitude of nations shall come of thee. Thou art a prince over them forever. There's this sense of, of dispensation heads at that final sacrament meeting, presenting their keys back to the Lord, presenting their, their posterity, well, their spiritual posterity, their dispensation 
that I'm, I'm bringing them home and here they are. I haven't lost any, as the Lord would say. In verse 56, Adam stood up in the midst of the congregation, the, the big family reunion. And notwithstanding, he was bowed down with age, being full of the Holy Ghost, predicted whatsoever should befall his posterity unto the latest generation. Yes, that is a family reunion worth reflecting on. And since past is prelude, it's one worth anticipating and preparing for as well. 57, these things were all written in the book of Enoch and are to be testified of in due time. There's actually a lot of early Jewish uh, literature and early Christian literature that speaks of Adam gathering his posterity. That's not found in the Bible, but it's found in other uh, Christian and Jewish tradition. Uh, and according to this, it's, it would be found in the book of Enoch as well, if we had the whole thing. Then verse 58, we come back to the 12. It's in a really abrupt way. It's like you're hearing this, I mean, the angels are singing, the veil is parting. We're having this divine family reunion and seeing this patriarchal pathway of priesthood. And all of a sudden, it's like, pull the e-brake, verse 58. Oh, it's the duty of the 12. Right, wait, 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 what? Again, this is, as I said, this is a, a bringing together of various revelations. And this is kind of the crescendo climax ending of the revelation that was received when those apostles came together to head off on their mission in 1835, right? It's to give us hope, a brightness of hope, and to, to cut through the darkness. Oh, understanding I'm part of this priesthood line. Yeah, that would give me hope. Would it comfort me in my afflictions? You better believe it. These first 57 verses are, are profound and inspiring, especially when it comes to what am I going to do with the, the responsibility and opportunity God has given me through his authority? Well, it was back in the 1831 earlier revelation of just kind of laying out how things work uh, in quorum presidencies and priesthood ecclesiology and so on. Uh, it's like, well, let's, we've got to come back down to earth, okay? Uh, and to put uh, this, that first revelation and the second half of this, I think in some ways it's just we've got to set the stage of what priesthood is all about before we get into the nitty gritty of, you're the deacon's quorum president. It's like, do you understand what you're a part of? Okay, we're, we're moving mountains and turning rivers out of their course. We are coming into the presence of God. So you 12 year old, you got some work to do in the deacon's quorum. <laughs> okay. Now, in some ways, if you look back and see something like verse 39, it is the duty of the 12. And then he launches into this, this grand panoramic vision of Adam and Adam on Diamond. And then 58. We're back to that. It is the duty of the Twelve, okay? So in the, what we're really getting is trying to understand what the Quorum of the Twelve is about. Uh, and this is kind of connective tissue, since in the 1831 uh, revelation, they didn't have a Quorum of the Twelve yet. They didn't understand yet what that would be. Such a great example, this revelation, of line upon line, okay? So in 58, it is the duty of the Twelve also to ordain and set in order all the other officers of the Church, agreeable to the revelation which says, to the Church of Christ in the land of Zion, in addition to the church laws respecting church business. So we've already had a lot of revelations along those lines, section 20 and section 84, and the High Council set up in section 102. And so in addition to all of those church laws, here's some more about officers in the church. Okay, so that's what we're gonna explain pretty much from here on out. In verse 60, you need an elders quorum president. Verily I say unto you, saith the Lord of hosts, there must needs be presiding elders to preside over those who are of the office of an elder. And if that's true of elders in 60, it's true of priests in 61. Priests to preside over those who are the office of priest, 62. Teachers to preside over those who are of the office of a teacher, in like manner, and also the deacons. So, 63, wherefore, from deacon to teacher, from teacher to priest, from priest to elder, severally as they are appointed according to the covenants and commandments of the church. So there, in a matter of four or five verses, is Aaronic priesthood quorum organization. Deacons, teachers, priests, with someone to preside over them at each level. I mean, the church is a well-oiled machine, especially when it comes to youth programs. And so here we see in the Aaronic priesthood offices, deacon, teacher, priest, and, and it, we're starting to spell it all out. Uh, verse 64, then comes the high priesthood, which is the greatest of all. So let's shift from Aaronic to Melchizedek. 65, wherefore it must needs be that one be appointed of the high priesthood to preside over the priesthood, and he shall be called the president of the high priesthood of the church. 
or, in other words, the presiding high priest over the high priesthood of the church. Now, speaking on the general level, that's the president of the church, okay? The senior apostle, uh, the head of the highest quorum of the church. In a stake, the, the president of the high priest's quorum is the stake president. In verse 67, from the same comes the administering of ordinances and blessings upon the church by the laying on of the hands. Ordinances and blessings, here we're talking about spiritual things, spiritual blessings as we saw earlier. Wherefore, verse 68, the office of a bishop is not equal unto it, for the office of a bishop is it administering all temporal things. That's this division of labor between Aaronic and Melchizedek. And bishop is technically an Aaronic office, uh, and, the, and they are the president of the Aaronic priesthood, president of the priest quorum, like we saw earlier. Now, 69, nevertheless, a bishop must be chosen from the high priesthood unless he is a literal descendant of Aaron. For unless he is a literal descendant of Aaron, he cannot hold the keys of that priesthood. That's what we saw back in section 68. It's what we saw a few verses ago here in section 107. 71, nevertheless, a high priest that is after the order of Melchizedek may be set apart unto the ministering of temporal things, having a knowledge of them by the spirit of truth. So there's, that's where Melchizedek and Aaronic overlap, where since Melchizedek's over everything, then a high priest and the Melchizedek priesthood can, can function in the role of bishop, since it's under that bigger umbrella of authority. 72, also to be a judge in Israel to do the business of the church, to sit in judgment upon transgressors, upon testimony, as it shall be laid before him according to the laws, by the assistance of his counselors, whom he has chosen or will choose among the elders of the church. So this is a step forward in the direction of understanding church discipline. Now remember, this is an earlier revelation, even though it comes later in the book, than section 102, which we studied last week to understand how discipline count, uh, disciplinary councils work, or membership councils in our day. Uh, on, on a state level, where it said if it's bigger than what a bishopric can handle with his counsel, well, here's we're seeing that right now. So the bishop is a judge in Israel. And according to 73, this disciplinary side of things is the duty of a bishop who is not a literal descendant of Aaron, but has been ordained to the high priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Thus shall he be a judge. Even a common judge among the inhabitants of Zion, or in a stake of Zion, or in any branch of the church where he shall be set apart unto this ministry, until the borders of Zion are enlarged and it becomes necessary to have other bishops or judges in Zion or anywhere else. And inasmuch as there are other bishops appointed, they shall act in the same office. So we're starting, I mean, we've been seeing this with the two church headquarters. And Oh, we're not, we're not all going to fit in, in Kirtland, but we're not all ready to go to Zion. In fact, a lot of people that are there weren't ready to go to begin with. Uh, but we'll have these two areas and two sets of three high priests and two sets of 12 uh, uh, council members, uh, high priests to come and help with all of that to settle the important difficulties. Oh, what about bishops? Oh, yeah, we need those too. And wherever they, the saints assemble, there should be a bishop to help. And so again, ecclesiology is coming into view here. 76, but a literal descendant of Aaron has a legal right to the presidency of this priesthood, to the keys of this ministry, to act in the office of bishop independently, without counselors, except in a case where a president of the high priesthood, after the order of Melchizedek, is tried to sit as a judge in Israel. So there's still always that, that thought of, but what if there's a literal seed? Uh, kind of truly patriarchal pathway, uh, straight on down. But like we saw in section 68, the first presidency is still going to be the one that, that can identify that, okay, by lineage. 77, the decision of either of these councils, agreeable to the commandment, which says, again, verily, I say unto you, the most important business of the church and the most difficult cases of the church, inasmuch as there is not satisfaction upon the decision of the bishop or judges, it shall be handed over and carried up unto the council of the church before the presidency of the high priesthood. So there we're building off of section 102, that there's a way to, uh, kind of co cases or courts of appeal, okay, bishop to stake, uh, stake to general authorities, to quorum of the 12, it, it, the, the highest, there's the supreme court, so to speak, uh, of the kingdom of God. 79, the presidency of the council of the high priesthood shall have power to call other high priests, even 12, to assist as counselors. And thus the presidency of the high priesthood and its counselors shall have power to decide upon testimony according to the laws of the church. Those are the ones that decide the most difficult cases. 
Verse 80, after this decision, it shall be had in remembrance no more before the Lord, for this is the highest counsel of the church of God and a final decision upon controversies in spiritual matters. The buck stops there. No wonder they need and deserve our confidence, our faith, and our prayers. Now in 82, inasmuch as a president of the high priesthood shall transgress, that's possible too, no one's infallible. He shall be had in remembrance before the common council of the church, who shall be assisted by twelve counselors of the high priesthood. And their decision upon his head shall be an end of controversy concerning him. Now, thankfully, that's never taken place. And a prophet has never had to be tried by the quorum of the twelve apostles. But I love the phrase in verse 83, I think there is relevance there, that when a decision is reached by a collective quorum, the collective quorums of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve, that should be the end of controversy concerning those things. Now, that does not mean we just, oh, they said it, so that's it, and we we don't do any thinking for ourselves. That's not the case. Uh, There are those who have left the church that, that love this quote Uh, that was printed in the ensign, I don't know, 100 years ago, that said, when the prophet has spoken, that's the end of thinking on the matter. And I believe it was uh, Heber J. Grant, uh, if I remember correctly, that issued a retraction. It was like, who was the, who's the intern at the ensign or the improvement era, whatever it was at the time, uh, that let that out? Because that's not the case. People, detractors love to quote the the initial statement. they, They don't seem to acknowledge the retraction. It's like, just because we've said it is not the end of thinking on the matter. We want you to think. We want you to gain a testimony of these things yourself. So there's unanimity that's beginning to extend across the church. We've simply done an intense amount of homework. Uh, We've done an intense amount of consecrated living. We have come to a unanimous decision here. And we're inviting you to seek the Lord's confirmation so that in your mind and heart, there is an end of controversy as well. That's hard to come by in our days of social media and the winds of popular opinion and and a lack of confidence and faith and prayer on our part, a lack of really knowing the hearts and minds of those that are leading us. And... (sighs) There's, I don't know, there's something in me that every time I associate with them, if I'm, more, if I'm sufficiently exposed to their lives and their teachings, and if I've... It becomes so beautifully clear that these are leaders of meekness and lowliness of heart and long-suffering, that they are leaders of righteousness and holiness, whose whole lives have been spent seeking to add to their faith virtue, and to their virtue knowledge, and knowledge temperance, and patience, and brotherly kindness, and charity, I, I sustain the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve with all of my confidence, and all of my faith, and all of my prayer. I do it with eyes wide open. I do it while thinking for myself. I do it while striving to gain a testimony independently of the things that they have worked so hard and prayed so long to understand themselves. Oh, you want to talk about a weight on the shoulders to have to be able to say, thus saith the Lord. As President Edward Maxwell used to say, a call to the Quorum of the Twelve is a call to perpetual inadequacy. How's that? Great, I have a calling that I'll never feel up to or equal to. And yet they do it. They do it in such a consecrated way. And especially in the midst of a lot of controversy currently regarding uh, decisions, regarding policies, regarding statements that honestly, I don't know if they could have said them any more lovingly than they've said. But as they try to prove contraries between things like love and law and truth and tolerance and how difficult it is to strike that, that razor's edge balance, There's all kinds of controversy going on. And unfortunately, it's keeping us from being one and and achieving the unity that is required in a Zion of one heart and one mind. I, I I hope you take verse 83 in that spirit, 
Not some kind of just lockstep. I have to, I just have to agree because we're not allowed to have controversy. No, there's, there's a path you can follow to receive the same revelation that they did. And that does end the controversy because I know it's the will of God. Even if it's not the will of society, that I, that I know it's the will of God, to, well, that it's a hard saying, like Jesus said, or like they said in, in John 6, but that they know the saying came from the Lord. That's, that's the end of controversy. Now, verse 84, Thus none shall be exempted from the justice and the laws of God, not even first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve. And they hold themselves to that uh, more than any passive observer ever could. That all things may be done in order and in solemnity before him, according to truth and righteousness. That's how they live. That's how they serve. That's how they lead. That's how they decide. Verse 85, again, verily I say unto you, the duty of a president over the office of a deacon, let's go back to that and work our way back up through the, the quorums, is to preside over 12 deacons, to sit in council with them, and to teach them their duty, edifying one another, as it is given according to the covenants. That language of responsibility will be repeated with later quorum presidents as well. But it's a great list. On the one hand, you preside over, and on the other hand, you sit in council with. Hmm, are we back to that same kind of diagonal organizational chart that we're, we're trying to wrap our brains around? If you're presiding over, that's the under the direction of half of the contrary. But if you're sitting in council with, that's the equal in authority, horizontal half of the contrary. And that's a lot to put on a 12-year-old's plate. Uh, they can even be 11 now, going on 12. But, but that, I guess that's why we're starting small. Just 12 of you. Can you handle that? Okay, you're responsible for a maximum of 11 other people. But edify each other. Edifying one another. That means it's going both ways. We saw that back in section 50. We saw it in section 88 with the, the School of the Prophets. Mutual benefit, mutual understanding, mutual edification. That's what should be happening within every quorum and class in the church. That's according to the covenant. Now, 86, the duty of the president over the office of the teachers is to preside over 24 of the teachers. They can handle a little bit more responsibility than the deacons could. They've been growing up in God. And to sit in council with them, there's two halves, preside over, sit in council with, teaching them the duties of their office as given in the covenants. So a lot of this teaching and a lot of duty here, what am I supposed to be doing uh, as I function under priesthood authority? 87, the duty of the president of the, over the priesthood of Aaron is to preside over 48 priests. We went from 12 to 24 to 48, to sit in council with them, to teach them the duties of their office, as is given in the covenants. So same kind of basic responsibilities, just more of it. You're, you're growing in, in competence uh, in order to be able to lead more people than you did before. Verse 88 again clarifies who is this president of the Aaronic priesthood. This president is to be a bishop, for this is one of the duties of this priesthood. Then 89, again, the duty of the president over the office of elders is to preside over 96 elders and to sit in council with them and to teach them according to the covenants. I've actually been in some wards that have more than 96 elders. And we have followed the, the council of section 107 and divided the quorum. Uh, there, there's something about having groups small enough that you know the, the individual members. And that's important as you explain duty. And as you sit in council together, we don't want anybody to get lost in the shuffle. We don't want anyone's voice to go unheard. In verse 90, this presidency is a distinct one from that of the 70. So 70s and elders are going to be separate. It's designed for those who do not travel into all the world. It's kind of a perfect the saints responsibility versus a proclaim the gospel responsibility. 91, again, the duty of the president of the office of the high priesthood is to preside over the whole church to be like unto Moses, we saw that parallel drawn to Joseph Smith on all of the, uh, dis the discussion of Zion's camp, traveling like Israel in the wilderness. And 92, behold, here is wisdom. Yea, to be a seer, a revelator, a translator, a prophet, having all the gifts of God, which he bestows upon the head of the church. And there was a hint towards that back in section 46 when we talked about the gifts of the Spirit. That to one is given all, that there can be a head in all of these things. 
And that's the president of the church. Prophet, seer, and revelator. Uh, what a gift to us to have someone with all of these gifts from God. In 93, it is according to the vision showing the order of the 70 that they should have seven presidents to preside over them, chosen out of the number of the 70. And the seventh president of those presidents is to preside over the six. So these, this is an interesting organizational form. We have threes, we have twelves, we have sevens with seventies. I remember going through the the open house of the San Diego Temple with my, un my dad's uncle who designed it. He was the chief architect for the San Diego Temple. Amazing building. And I wanted to be an architect at the time. So he kind of took me under his wing and was showing me around and you know, telling me to look at different things. But that's one of the things he said. Pay attention to the numbers of the windows. And sure enough, they tended to be in groups of three and groups of seven and groups of twelve. And so here, same idea where we got the three, we got the twelve. Now we've got the seven. Three, you can think Godhead. Twelve, you could think uh, house of Is tribes of Israel. Seven, you can think days of creation or dispensations or or seals uh, for the for the work of God. It's interesting to see this organization uh, unfold. And of those seventy, seven of them will be the presidents. And of that seven, one will be the president. Oh, the, the senior president of the seventy, uh, which again suggests this: there needs to be leadership and hierarchy, even with equality and democracy. Then ninety-six, fascinating verse, and also other seventy, until seven times seventy if the labor in the vineyard of necessity requires it. So this isn't just that we're going to have seven quorums of 70. It, there could be seven times 70 quorums of 70. It just depends on how much labor is required. Uh, and for much of church history, there were a bunch of uh, quorums of 70 on the stake level. Uh, we can do that all on, on local. Then, uh, in, in more recent memory, it was no... There's going to be a general quorum of 70. There's a, a, a reorganization of the council of the 70. And what, then what happens from there is then there's a, a first quorum of 70. There is a second quorum of the 70. And then they, we keep adding as the labor in the vineyard of necessity requires it. There's just too much work to be done. It, gone, long gone are the days when an apostle can call every single patriarch in every single stake. Long gone are the days where an apostle can go to every state conference. Uh, even gone are the days when a, a general authority 70 can come. And so some are under the direction of your stake presidency alone. That's okay. They have authority and jurisdiction. We saw that earlier in this revelation. But to see, I think we're at 12 now. And the first two quorums of 70 are general authorities. They preside wherever they go, unless there's a higher presiding authority in, in the, the first presidency of the quorum of the 12 with them. And then it's geographical. And third, fourth, fifth, sixth, all the way to twelfth, it's, you know, Brazil is one quorum of the 70. And Asia is a quorum of the 70. And Africa is a quorum of the 70. And Europe's a quorum of the 70. And the, the, you, the North America is split up into several. And South America has another one separate from, from Brazil because the work is so big in Brazil. It's just amazing to watch verse 96 unfold before our eyes. I believe, if I remember correctly, I think it was President Packer, that at some point when this first happened, it was like, huh. Oh, we're finally living into section 107, verse 96. It's been there all along. And sometimes there are those little hidden gems where the Lord saw things coming and we just need to study a little harder to realize, oh yeah, that is how things are supposed to be organized. It's amazing. Well, verse 97 then, these 70 are to be traveling ministers unto the Gentiles first and also unto the Jews. 98, whereas other officers of the church who belong not unto the twelve, neither to the seventy, are not under the responsibility to travel among all nations, but are to travel as their circumstances shall allow, notwithstanding they may hold as high and responsible offices in the church. Local versus general, area seventies uh, versus general authority seventies. It's amazing to see just how, well, just what a house of order the Lord has established for us here on earth. So where does that leave us, individual members? It leaves us with 99 and 100. Wherefore? So because of all that's gone before, this is a great ending to this long and, and powerful revelation. Because of everything that I've explained, the big picture items of what the priesthood is, 
the more specific details of how to organize things in, in individual classes and quorums. Wherefore, now let every man learn his duty. And again, because we understand that all authority is priesthood authority, we can expand this. Let every man and woman learn his or her duty. And to act in the office in which he or she is appointed in all diligence. To learn it and then to act it. To, it's like King Benjamin, if you believe these things, see that ye do them. It's not enough to know our duty and then be derelict in it. Uh, we, can't be, we cannot afford to be slothful and unwise servants. Remember that verse back in section 58? If you have to be told everything, here, you are being told. But you've got to act on it, because I'm not going to tell you every detail. This is the big picture organization. Now go do something and seek a revelation individually. Here's the institutional one. Now go get your individual one to find out what your specific duty entails. Don't be slothful on this. That's what he says in verse 100. He that is slothful shall not be counted worthy to stand. And he that learns not his duty and shows himself not approved shall not be counted worthy to stand. Even so, amen. Show yourself approved. There's the, the worthiness side. Learn your duty and then stand in it faithfully, actively, unslothfully. Be an, a lively member, as uh, Frederick G. Williams was told. There's the, there's the competence side of things. And as we do those things together with whatever our duty, whatever, whatever our office, whatever our authority might be, we're not being slothful. We're being wise. Because as we learned back in section 58, the power is in you. You can be an agent unto yourself. You can bring to pass much righteousness. Now, as I said before, bookending this revelation are examples of two men who did exactly that who wanted to learn their duty, who didn't want to be slothful, who, who wanted to learn it and then act in it and make a difference in the world. We already met Warren Cowdery, who did just that with section 106. And in section 108, we get to meet Lyman Sherman, who does it as well. Wonderful church member. He, was, he had been ordained a 70. He's a member of the presidency of the 70. So you better believe he's, his ears perk up with section 107. Like, okay, this is how it's, I'm supposed to do things. But more specifically for me, is there any more direction that I can receive from the Lord? So he goes to Joseph Smith and asks for it. I would talk about a, 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 a poster child for what we just saw in section 107. Go learn your duty. And he came to the prophet asking for it. We can do and should do the same. Go horizontal to a, a local leader and best of all, go vertical and find out what the Lord would have you know. This brief revelation has some beautiful counsel. Starting in verse 1, Verily thus saith the Lord unto you, my servant Lyman, Your sins are forgiven you, because you have obeyed my voice in coming up hither this morning to receive counsel of him whom I have appointed. Can you sense the Lord's gratitude for this humble servant who didn't just automatically think, Well, I'm in a leadership position. I've got it all figured out. I must be good at this. It's No, there's a sense of inadequacy of, like Elder Maxwell said, perpetual. There's a sense of unworthiness. Remember what the Quorum of the Twelve said when they approached Joseph about this revelation. We're not asking this out of our worthiness. We're asking for it out of our unworthiness. But here Lyman Sherman is reassured. Your sins are forgiven. You've shown this meekness to come and seek my will and receive this counsel. Verse 2, Therefore, let your soul be at rest concerning your spiritual standing and resist no more my voice. I wonder about that resist no more my voice. I wonder, was there a part of Lyman Sherman that before was like, I don't know if I can do this. I mean, that sounds like Warren Cowdery. Sounds like Amulet for that matter. I knew, but I would not know. At what, at what point did Warren Cowdery bow his head before the scepter of God? Well, at what point did Lyman Sherman do the same and stop resisting the Lord's voice? But I also wonder, sometimes what we resist is not just the Lord's voice of calling us to duty. But sometimes we resist the Lord's voice of reassuring us that all is well in our lives and that we are forgiven of our sins. There are so many that it, find it easy to forgive others, but have a really hard time forgiving themselves. 
And so no wonder they, he needed to be reassured in verse 2, let your soul be at rest. Do you remember what Enos said about his experience? When God said, when the Lord said to him, your sins are forgiven, Enos said, I knew that God could not lie, wherefore my guilt was swept away. If the Lord says to you, your sins are forgiven you, like he said in verse 1, then is it a lack of trust on our part? A lack of faith in his forgiveness that makes us hold on to that guilt instead of letting it be swept away? I love the way Enos puts that. My, my guilt was swept away. It was gone, despite all that I'd done wrong. And why was it gone without a trace? Because I knew God couldn't lie. I trusted his character. And so if God says I'm forgiven, I know I'm forgiven. In this case, let your soul be at rest. Move forward. There's no need to ever look back. Verse 3, arise up and be more careful henceforth in observing your vows, which you have made and do make, and you shall be blessed with exceeding great blessings. You see, just because you're forgiven once doesn't mean you'll, you'll never fall back into, into problems. Just be more careful. And I'm giving you the chance to do so. Don't let your future be held hostage by your past, but learn from your past so you can be prepared to be more careful in your future. Verse 4, wait patiently until the solemn assembly shall be called of my servants. Then you shall be remembered with the first of mine elders and receive right by ordination with the rest of mine elders whom I have chosen. You see the solemn assembly here is the one that's going to take place the following year when the Kirtland Temple is dedicated. When that takes place and you are all endowed with power from on high, then go forth. Until then, wait patiently. Continue to grow and progress and become something, but you're not, you're not being sent out quite yet. When the time comes, then you'll go forth and you'll, I love this phrase, you'll be remembered with the first of mine elders. Now I wonder, I don't know well enough the personality of Lyman Sherman, but again, if he has to be reassured that he's forgiven and then re-reassured that your soul can be at rest, if there's a sense of, uh, now, now be, be careful now, you don't want to fall back into things. I just wonder if there's a, a humility, a meekness, a sense of inadequacy or inferiority on Lyman Sherman's part. To be, to be reminded in four, you'll be remembered with the first of mine elders. You're not behind any of them just because you made some mistakes and needed to be forgiven. You remember in, everybody seems to love that verse in, in Alma that talks about Captain Moroni. That if all men had been and were and ever could be like unto him, then the very powers of hell would be shaken forever. Satan would have no more power over the hearts of the children of men. It's awesome. It's like I'm surprised more children aren't named Captain Moroni. <laughs> because, man, if everybody could be like him. In fact, the guy who said that did name his son Moroni. <laughs> right? It's like, I want my boy to, be, to live up to be, to be like him. But the amazing thing about that passage where Mormon is just effusive of his, in his praise of Moroni, that never seemed to do a thing wrong in his life. I mean, talk about this guy is just golden child from the beginning, is the verse right after it. Right after singing Captain Moroni's praises, Mormon continues by writing this. Behold, he, Captain Moroni, was a man like unto Ammon, the son of Mosiah, yea, and even the other sons of Mosiah, yea, and also Alma and his sons, for they were all men of God. Now, wait a minute. Yeah, they are all men of God, but they weren't all perpetually men of God. They were once they con converted or once they repented, but all the other guys that Mormon just listed had major things to repent of. Ammon, sons of Mosiah, Alma, Alma the Younger, uh, uh, Corianton at least, among the sons of, of Alma the Younger. It, I love the fact that Mormon is taking a lot of people who might feel less than, it's kind of a second tier saint, because they've made mistakes in their youth. That's not how Mormon sees it. He elevates them to first tier status. He remembers them with the first of mine elders and says, oh, those repented sinners. They're no different, no less than. They're just like Captain Moroni. And that to me is so beautifully reassuring. Let your soul be at rest. Let your guilt be swept away. 
Verse 5, Behold, this is the promise of the Father unto you, if you continue faithful. Bank on it. You have his word on it. I am the word of God. Then in 6, It shall be fulfilled upon you in that day that you shall have right to preach my gospel, wheresoever I shall send you from henceforth from that time. The right to preach my gospel? Oh, it's, it's such a privilege when we are granted that right. And once we have it, verse 7, Therefore, strengthen your brethren in all your conversation, in all your prayers, in all your exhortations, in all your doings. Did you catch the word that kept getting repeated? All. Every time you open your mouth, Elder Sherman, strengthen somebody. Every time you pray, strengthen the people that are listening. Every time you exhort someone to be better, then leave them better than you found them. Strengthen. Everything you do should have a strengthening effect on those that are around you. Now that's all, that's a high percentage. How are we doing on that? Now this one's tough. It needs to become, when, when our eye is single to the glory of God and we've just obtained the mind of Christ and we've come to be like Jesus, we're all far away from where we need to be on that. But if we're moving in that direction, then this becomes almost instinctive. It becomes natural to us since we've put off the natural man. And we just want to leave people better than we found them. Any, any and every chance we can get. I love this passage because it reminds me of one of my... I had a student in, in Tennessee. I, I loved this kid. He was hilarious. Really quirky. The kind of guy that probably feels more com uh, comfortable at Comic-Con than in normal life. And he just had such a fun sense of humor. His perspective on scripture, he, was, he came to the institute every week and just asked them the, the craziest questions before class started, and usually about sci-fi or fantasy or things like that. And, uh, but then once we got into scripture, he had really great insights as well. Well, uh, he ended up deciding to serve a mission, which was a, a beautiful uh, oh, miracle by, by some people's standards. They weren't sure if he was going to go. And, and he went on a mission, and his letters, his emails home, were just as quirky as he always was. And full of just fun and, and humor and sarcasm and not much else, to be honest. Uh, I was on the list, too. I love reading my, my students' emails to see them grow up in God as missionaries. But his were just kind of head-scratchers of like, what's he do? What, what, it, is this just all P-Day stuff that, that he's up to? I mean, he was working hard, I'm sure, but you just didn't know exactly what he was doing or what effect it was having on him or others based on his emails. And uh, knowing his personality, I, you could kind of sense, yeah, t being serious doesn't come naturally to him. And so how do I talk about serious and spiritual things? Uh, I don't know. And so we just kind of laugh it off instead, right? I actually ran into his father at church one day and his dad was... I'm like, hey, how's, how's your son doing? What do you hear from him? And, and he was, you could tell he was so proud of his son to be out in the mission field, but at the same time, he was kind of like, uh, I don't know, to be honest. I get the same emails as you probably do, and I don't, I don't, I can't make sense of them. Uh, I don't, they're, uh. And he was just, I wish I knew better what he was feeling and what he was going through and the spiritual experiences he was having and so on. And that I could support him better or help him or just, rejoice with him. And it was interesting as I kept getting these wonderfully funny, quirky emails that, but were strange. This verse came and just hit me really hard as I realized this is a missionary set apart to, I mean, given the right to preach God's gospel. And in his opportunity every week to send an email home, he wasn't strengthening his brethren. And so with as much sensitivity as I could, I, I mustered my courage and I sent this elder a, an email and said to him how much I loved him and in the spirit of my love for him, hoped that he would take this chastisement uh, with, in the spirit that it was given. And I quoted section 108, verse 7 to him and just said, Elder, you're called to 
to strengthen people in all of your conversations, including your electronic ones. In all of your doings. I know you're doing great good for the people that you're serving there in the field. But what about us back home? Because guess what? You'll end up being with us more than with them. Your family members are the, are the investigators you, you can spend eternity with. Your greatest converts might be the ones that read your message rather than just hear it firsthand. And so I challenge you to, to lay on the altar of sacrifice a piece of your personality. It'd still be you. Uh, your last name's on that missionary tag, after all. But your priesthood office is on it, too. And the name of Christ and his church is on it as well. So be you, but be the best version of you. And in all that you do, strengthen us. I, I concluded that email just saying, as one of your brethren, please strengthen me. Well, it didn't take long before I got his response. A direct one to me, and, and, and then an indirect one to everybody else. The direct one to me simply said, Behold, this is a hard thing you have required of us. I fear lest the Gentiles shall mock at my words. Now, this kid knew his scriptures. I know, I know. Say not, sarcasm is my thing. Sincerity is just difficult for me. And then a final line. I'll work on it. Well, he did work on it. In his next letter, to his next email to everybody, it was like, okay, I got ca called out by Bro Hal, and uh, it's just really hard for me. Spiritual things are personal things to me, and I just don't know how to explain them and still be myself. Um, but if you'll be patient with me, as I'm being patient with Brother Halverson, <laughs> he said, because I could have, I could have gotten angry, I could have gotten offended, and said, who cares? Uh, I, I'm gonna, just going to be me. But instead, his own humility, his own meekness, he said, I'm going to try. And I'll put it this way. I get tons of missionary emails, <laughs> and they're awesome. They're amazing to see, and I am strengthened by them. But without saying anything against any other set of emails I've ever received, I've never gotten a set quite like the ones I read from this elder moving forward. It took him a while to kind of find the gear, okay? It took him a while to, to get there. But once he realized that I can be me and I can be the best me, I can be quirky and fun, but I can be deep and I can be spiritual and I can be thoughtful. And those were all gifts of his as well. Honestly, I learned things about the gospel, about human nature, about missionary work from his emails home that I had never thought of as a missionary myself or as a gospel teacher myself. Seriously, I was blown away. And for this particular elder, I am so grateful that once he made that pivot in his, in his service, he strengthened me in all of his conversations. And I thank him for that. I thank all of those who strengthen me in every comment you leave, who the members of my ward who strengthen me in every testimony, Students who strengthen me with every question or comment. Family members who strengthen. It's just, it's amazing to see people who just leave a wake of strengthened people behind them. And everywhere they go, they leave people better than they started. That's what God is calling Lyman Sherman to. It's what God is calling us all to. And if we'll do it, verse 8, Behold and lo, I am with you to bless you and deliver you forever. Amen. No one strengthens others more than Jesus does. And if he will be with us, of course he will bless us and deliver us. Best of all, he'll help us bless and deliver others. He, him, him strengthening us is what allows us to strengthen others. And sure enough, that was Lyman Sherman. For the rest of what ended up being a brief life, but a life filled of service and strengthening. In his earlier ordination, he was even blessed with this. Your faith shall be unshaken. You can probably guess why I love that promise so much. Well, in the spirit of that unshaken faith, can I share one last statement from Orson Pratt? 
that to me does a beautiful job of explaining oh this line upon line approach to revelation that we see manifest so clearly in section 107 within itself as well as building upon other priesthood revelations like 20 and 84 or more personally the line upon line growing up in god that you see in a warren cowdery just slowly overcoming peer pressure and caring less what other people think and coming unto christ or in uh, Lyman Sherman, overcoming his own sense of inadequacy and slowly growing into these callings to strengthen all around him. Orson Pratt said this, The Lord made manifest these things not all at once, but from time to time, as the people progressed and were counted worthy in his sight to receive further knowledge upon these things. Now you may ask why it was that the Lord did not give the whole pattern at once, why he did not unfold everything all in a moment. It's like, why didn't Joseph walk out of the sacred grove with the church handbook of instructions under his arm? It would have been so perfect. No, it was because we were as little children then. And indeed, I am of the opinion that many of us are little children still. Well, he called me out on that. And we could not bear all things at once. Therefore, he revealed unto us enough from time to time to set our minds reflecting he revealed sufficient to cause us to be stirred up in our minds, to pray unto him. And when we prayed unto him about any of the duties of the priesthood, then he would reveal it. I mean, that's Warren Cowdery and Lyman Sherman for you. But God would be sought unto by his people before he would reveal a fullness of knowledge upon these important subjects. You get what Orson Pratt's trying to say? God wants to be sought after. It's not that he's playing hard to get, okay? He's not hard to get, but he requires some effort on our part to come unto him. He, he kindles a burning bush and then waits to see if we'll turn aside. He, he, he sends an angel to a young 17-year-old boy prophet and gives a little bit of message and then waits to see if he'll if he'll roll over and go back to sleep, or if he'll meditate and marvel and muse, in which case another round of revelation will come. The, the rounds of revelation that we're seeing in the Doctrine and Covenants are breathtaking. And it's the Lord's way of giving us something to think about, something to ponder, something to act upon, something to grow into. As we'll see next week when we study the dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple which is a masterpiece. God's ultimate goal is to help us grow up in him. And with this line upon line, precept upon precept kind of revelation, that's exactly what he's doing.